This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, and Eventide. So get ready to rock. I'm a Pro Tools guy, so if you're using Logic or Studio One, you can't give me the session. So what I say then is I say, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to export me a a set of dry stems, and I want you to give me a set of wet stems. And then what I do in my Pro Tools rig, I just start balancing it to match the rough mix. So this is one of Michael Brower's things. He said the phrase is called meet it and beat it. So first thing you do, meet the rough mix, then you beat the rough mix. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you are trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a ton of money on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers the instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention recording studio rock stars. Go to whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. What do Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mike Kozowski, Dave Pensato, and George Massenberg all have in common? They all have great things to say about Eventide. Originating in a New York City basement in 1971 with the original Instant Phaser and H910 Harmonizer, Eventide continues to transform the sound of music with the iconic H9000 Harmonizer, visionary guitar effects like the H9 pedal, and now a whole suite of incredible plugins for your studio. Go to eventide.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at owc.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Daniel Ford, a.k.a. Dr. Ford. Six times award-winning producer. Oh, eight Eight. times. Nice. That just dates the last time I did your your, uh, intro right there. Nice. You want to rebump that? No, no. Leave it right in there. Eight times award-winning producer and mixer with music at number one on iTunes and the Billboard Top 20. Daniel has Studio C of the world-famous Sound Kitchen Studios here in Nashville and has been on the show with us before for episode RSR 136 to talk about and share some great tips for vocal mixing, among many other things. We also covered Daniel's recording journey, studying under West Coast legends Ronnie King and DJ Battlecat of Tupac, Snoop, and Dr. Dre Cred. So go back and check out that episode to learn more about Daniel's background. But today we decided to bring Dr. Ford back to focus strictly on mixing in your home studio. Mm -hmm. Let's learn what we can about taking the tracks that you have or that people send you and mixing the drums, bass, guitars, keys, and vocals to sound like a polished and professional mix. We're going to dig into each element of a mix and break down some of the challenges and solutions that you might run into when mixing. Dr. Ford has lots of experience teaching online and in person as well. So if you want to follow up this interview to learn more, then make sure to check out his website at drford.com or go visit his YouTube channel where he does regular videos, including a new series called The Doctor's Office. Oh, yeah. Uh, Of course, I'll include the links in the show notes below and a video player so you can simply click right through. Please welcome Daniel, a.k.a. Dr. Ford, back to Recording Studio Rockstars. Thanks for having me. Dr. Ford, are you ready to rock again, man? Are you ready to rock? Are you you ready to continue the rock? I am always ready, and I'm happy to be here, and I love seeing your puppy, and, you know, I'm a dog person. Daisy Do, the the studio dog. Just love her. 
Uh, uh, a lot of times we call her Daisy Don't. <laughs> <laughs> no. She's a good girl. Um, so, hey, uh, I know you've had a lot of cool things going on. Yeah. Um, you know, I know uh, people may be listening to this later on for sure. But uh, do you want to give us an update on what's new with you? And, uh, and you, you've you got some cool yeah. travels coming up, it sounded okay, like. Okay, so the first little funny story I want to tell is about listening to the RJR, uh, RSR, I say RJR, the RSR podcast is that I went to go have a, a fair bit of dentistry. I was going to have, I hadn't been to the dentist in like a decade and I was going to do five cavities. And so I'm sitting down and they're like, all right, we're going to just knock you and it's going to be like, two and a half hours of drilling in your face. They are like, oh, so man. do you want the TV? And I could put some headphones on you. And I was all, no, no, I, I got my earbuds. So I put on Recording Studio Rockstars podcast. Oh, wow. And so I was <laughs> listening to your podcast and I can't think of the guy's name, but I can see his face. He's a mastering engineer here in town. And it was the two of you guys talking, uh, short, spiky hair, blonde dude. And um, I've met him at parties and stuff. Maybe it was Dan Scheich or somebody that like that. That sounds exactly yeah. right. I think it was Dan Scheich. So it was you and Dan Scheich. And so they put the mask on my face and I had the earbuds in and it's like, Hey, you went through the intro. Are you ready to rock? And I was like, I was and like, you're cool. on nitrous. The oh, whole yeah. time. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, yeah, all right, this is going to be great. And I sat down and it instantly turned into like, like you like, I swear I was two hours of me going like, what are they talking about? I was. Yes. <laughs> I call that the six million dollar man. Sound Dude, it effects. was. Ch -ch 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 it was crazy, <laughs> and I was trying to follow so hard, but like all I could hear was like me in my mouth, and the and it was just ridiculous. And I, it was fun though. It was fun to try and follow along, and all I remember is like your smiling face through audio, like <laughs> popping around in my head. It was great. It was like, just, it couldn't have been more ridiculous. Dude, that's what I, a good story, that's man. That's so funny. What yeah. a good story. Uh, so Dan, if you're listening to this one, I mean, there you were, man. Little did you know you would be the comforting voice, you know, <laughs> in somebody's ears while they were on a long, a two and a half hour nitrous trip. Oh my God, it was, that's pretty it intense. It was crazy. Uh, but you know, it's the, it's the only way to fly, man. Because <laughs> nobody wants to get drilled when they're fresh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Last time I was at the dentist and they gave me nitrous, I was, um, the dentist kept saying stuff to me and he has this like really kind of fake comforting voice. Yeah. It's like, okay, we're just going to go in here and take a look at this right now. You you might feel just a little bit and then it's like, oh, you yeah. know, and I remember try, trying to crack jokes with him. I was like, dude, just don't, you know, remind me never to like place a bet with you or anything like that. <laughs> I don't know what I said. It was some dumb thing like that. And he was just like, ha, ha, ha. I kept, kept going. Dennis are funny. <laughs> All right. So, and then, but you've got okay. some music coming out too with your wife, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, everybody has a pet project and a muse. Mine has been my longtime girlfriend uh, slash fiance wife to be. And so uh, Hannah uh, has an incredibly dynamic voice and she is the muse behind all of my techniques. Uh, if you guys remember, I did, I think I told the story about when I went to mix with the masters and I talked with Jack Joseph Puig and, and I was showing him the, the stuff I'd done with her and he, you know, and I had this really, did I tell this story about when yeah, I, I think so? Yeah. And then um, you also shared with us this amazing mix setup you have uh, to handle whistle tones. That's, okay. And all so this kind so of stuff. all of that is, you know, it comes from having a, pet project. And I strongly recommend that for any mixer. You got to have something incredibly difficult that you work on that isn't like a paying client, that it can be the thing that you beat your head against the wall for. Because when you've got everyday clients that are paying you money that feed your bills, you need to have a fast, expeditious workflow that allows you to succeed easily so that you can go back to the artistic side of mixing so that you're not right. sitting there spending all day fixing the math and the science clipboard side of it. You you want to get through that as fast as possible, which I like to call re-engineering. Yeah, and the and the clients don't really probably enjoy watching you try oh, every no. plug in. No, in it's your data arsenal, entry, you know? right? So I, I and actually that's how I sell it to them. I say they say, well, do I sit here and watch you mix all day? And I say, no, 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 because it's like a whole day of data entry. And then they always go, oh yeah, I don't want to see that, right. right? So I said, so what I do is I get the mix as far as I can do it. Then I'm going to send it to you. Then I want you to come in and let's push it the last ten feet together. And that's usually works. And that's how I get like mixed two or three. Ooh, I approved. like that. Push it the last 10 feet. Right. Together. And then, and you know what I honestly do is they'll be like, Hey, the high hat's too loud. And I'll be like, well, come here. And I literally say, that's the fader. Put it where you want to put it. And I'm telling you nine times out of 10, they put it back or lower than where you left it. They'll be, they'll put the, they'll move it. They wiggle it and they go, that sounds about right. And it's like exactly where you left it. Right. <laughs> because that's always how it is. They, you know, they, once they hear it low, they're like, oh, no, yeah, that's not going to work. I know why you did that. So 
there is something interactive about bringing them in because they'll confirm your things. Um, and everybody has fake gear that they've the jokes about the fake gear and all that stuff anyway. So, that, you know, that, that, it, uh, pops an idea into my head too. So like, uh, PreSonus makes the one fader box, yeah. you know, and it might be well worth having two of those one, one for you up at the mix desk and one that's just the producer one fader. I don't, I don't use it, be it but it'd be kind of cool to like just assign his, you know, or her one fader yeah. to that track. And it's like to reset the level. There. It could be interesting. The, uh, I'll tell you what, for the money, that original uh, Presonus Fader 1, that was the first like MIDI fader that I had ever bought. I loved that thing. The ergonomics of the design that allow you to do the playhead transport plus switch between all of the automation modes and have one fader and a pan knob, incredibly powerful. So if anybody doesn't have anything, spend the 100 bucks and get one of those things. The only downside to it is that it uses a Huey protocol, so the resolution on the fader is not super smooth. Right, right. But past that, I mean, for a hundred bucks, you're in the game. So, yes. okay. So Hannah is my, my muse. And again, I'm talking about a wild dynamic shift when she's in her, in her verses and her low chest voice. And she's in this beautiful, warm, kind of sultry, rich thing. And then all of a sudden she'll shift to, you know, 130 decibel belting what they call vocal pedagogy, you know, and, and, and it goes like huge. And then you can't compress these the same way. So you have an option of either like splitting the track with different compressors and doing, and I don't want to do all that. So I developed the parallel compression thing that we, we talked about last time, plus yeah. um, the whistle tones before that, so that I'm not dealing with the whistle, whistle tones hitting the threshold for the compressors and blah, 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 blah. And Rox, as a reminder, that's episode 136, if you want to listen to that. Yeah. And then also you included a great chart where you drew it out for us. Oh, fantastic. So I just went and looked at okay, it. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's very cool. So, very and I'm clear. happy to, a lot of this stuff is way easier visual to see it. And I'm definitely someone who talks with their hands and their concepts that I, I pretend that I can, like, I don't have a synthogy or whatever they call it, that thing where you can see sounds. I don't have All that. Right, colors when you hear sounds. But I like pretend that I do when I'm looking at the speakers and it really helps me. And so I can kind of visualize it with my hands and see all that. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. So we really, as soon as I moved back to Nashville in 2017, um, we started working on Hannah's record in 2018 when I had downtime and I was rebuilding the business because her management and booking and everybody was like, we need a new record. And I wanted to use Nashville players and give her an, a fresh sound. And so we did that. So uh, previously there was some releases that the management pushed out before we were ready, but we just went with it anyways. So one of those songs we brought back in, uh, we got Big Smo, or I think he just wants to go by Smo. He did a feature on it. And so we re-released that this summer. And then uh, one of the things we did is we hooked up with a radio promoter in the UK and he actually preferred the original version for the UK market. And so, you know, for everybody who's trying to launch their own pet projects, that radio is still a great bastion for exposing. There's still a mass amount of people who listen to FM radio in the car. But the problem is, in my opinion, that FM radio in the States is locked up by the major labels. Why? Because every time something spins, it still earns 10 cents. Right. Interesting. S streaming only earns 0 0.0039 on Spotify. So for every million spins on Spotify, you make $4,000 for the master and $500 for songwriting and publishing. But on radio, for every million dollar, for every million spins, you're going to make $100,000 for songwriting and publishing, right? So they're always going to, and those numbers are approximate for the sake of the discussion, but they're always going to keep radio locked up. And the other thing that happens is, is that you either have to hire an independent radio promoter in the States that has the relationships starting price somewhere around $35,000 to get started. That'll take you for a month or two. And then they're going to hit you up for another hundred thousand dollars to $150,000 to do a radio promo tour with flights and hotels. I've priced this all out. Uh, and if you know the right guy. And so what happens is, is that counterpart exists for the record labels. There's a VP of radio promotions who does all that job automatically. It's built into your contract for all the people who are on the label roster. So any independent act that wants to try and get to American radio has to do one or two things. First, you got to sign up for CDX, one of the CDX distribution platforms. CDX is a um, enhanced digital disc that gives you all the metadata. So the first hurdle for getting on FM radio is that they won't take unsolicited work because they can't pay it out correctly. And if they can't pay it out correctly and log it correctly, they're in violation of what are the FDA's acts for how they got to pay stuff out, right? Yeah. This is the whole double dipping thing that they 
aren't allowed to do. And they do anyways. They just do it under the table. So what happens is, is that if you pay the money, and I know there's a platform, CDX. I went to CRS in Nashville a couple of years back, and I sat in the thing, and I met the guy. It's $1,500 to get your song on CDX. That goes out once a month and gets distributed to a thousand national radio stations. Okay, there's a few people that do that. So maybe the price is going to fluctuate. But the guy I talked to who is pretty good at it, been doing it for 40 years, 1500 bucks to get on. Then once you're on, it gets sent out to all the program directors. They have a choice. They're either going to pick you up or not. They're going to needle drop that record and be like, oh, this is cool. And then, you know, interns are listening to it. And maybe you get to the program director who says, sure, I'll do that. But the record labels call the program directors. The VP of radio promo has a direct line. They've been working together for 30 years. And he goes, hey, Bobby, I got a new song for you. Oh, no, I got a new song. Yeah, here. Oh, guess what? I got the new Katy Perry song. Ooh, killer. Yeah, send that over. Cool. You can only have it if you also give a power play to the new artists we signed. So here's both of the songs. You get them both or you get none. Yeah, of course. Anything for you, man. Send her in. We want to do an interview. Right? So so this is whole system in place that is so exclusive to the indie artist. So I've done, all, I mean, this again, this is, you learn all this stuff when you're this trying to- This is the U.S. market you're describing. U.S. market. Now, but you guys are headed over to U.K., so so what are you running into there now? Yeah. None of that. And that's the beauty of thinking about the old, remember when the boy bands all went to the U.K. and they said, launch them in the U.K. and bring them back to the U.S.? Yeah. These are the reasons why. Because they were building a brand new sound that hadn't been, you know, tried and tested. So the record labels, the name of the record label is Don't Take Risks. Right. Yeah. Mitig- totally. Mitigate risk, mitigate loss, get the most profit. It's a business. And yes, they want to put out great music and everybody wants accolades, but they would rather have profit than accolades. Right. Because they have voting blocks. So they're just going to vote right, their totally, own stuff up totally. to the top anyways. So what did you guys do over there? What do you, what do you tap into? Cause you probably have to pay somebody for something over you there. Have, right. So we got uh, a tried and true radio promoter that we knew. So Hannah had done a few independent artist tours in Ireland one of the artists over there that we had worked with a hundred times. They're good friends now. Done a lot of shows together. He used this promoter, which again, I'm not going to get into that side of it, but like we used a promoter, the promoter, anybody can sign up for hot disc. So I'll just put that out there. Hot disc is one of these companies that promotes to, we got a thousand radio stations from, so I, I think it's like 350 bucks. Don't quote me on that, but it's on the website. But again, that's not what you're paying for. That's just a a fee that's included in what you're paying for because it's a distribution model. So hot disk is like CDX and then it gives you the song plus the metadata. So hot disk absolutely loved lazy river, which was the name of this Hannah Anders lazy river. If you want to check it out. Okay, cool. They loved it. And so they gave us the number one spot on that month's hot disk, which is great. So it went out and it was the first song all the program directors heard. We entered their client. So hot disk of course is made up of clients. They have their own top 40 We entered their top 40 at number 22 on the first week, which is based on pickups and DJ reactions. It rose to 11 on the second week. It rose to seven on the third week. It stayed at seven on the fourth week. And then I don't know the results I should have them today for week number five. After six weeks, you get a list of the top 50 stations that are playing your song and actual contact. And then now what we've got is we're going to release our second single now that we've got our feet wet which I just put on my Facebook page. It's called While I Still Got Time. Hannah went on the morning news this last week and she did an acoustic performance of it, which I think turned out gorgeous. Um, She sounded great and it was really cool to hear it with just an acoustic guitar because you could really focus on the words and what she was singing. Cool. And um, so that's up there if you want to listen to it. And I co-wrote that and um, we can talk about the impetus of that song, but um, that'll sidetrack us. Yeah, yeah. I think we're, bro, rock stars, we promise we'll get to mixing. It's coming oh, soon. We got so much Hang to talk tight. about. So then, um, so that is now currently spinning on, that, well, we don't know how many, but it's on a bunch of radio stations all over England and the UK, or so, so Scotland, Ireland, Europe, South Africa, and Australia. And what's really cool about those radio markets over there is they're not genre specific. So you have like an hour of country programming or you have an hour of rock programming or an hour of rap. So it's like, you can get on a bunch of different radio stations, whereas here in America, that radio station only plays this. Right, right. So you're you're very specific market demographic, yeah. and and they're open to American talent over there. They love us. Ireland loves American country, like they just adore it. They're so desperate for entertainment. Hannah went over there and did pub tours, and what you would consider like a dive bar to them is the family pub they've been going to. It's their key source of information for their society. It's like it's the only pub. This, so it's so deep over there in the pub scene that 
the owner of the pub is called a publican. He is also the undertaker. I'm dead serious. Wow. And it's a, it's an honor to be that, to be the publican for a, for a county, like County Cork. And there's the one uh, pub in the center and it's like the, the, the dude is the undertaker and they, and you ask them why. And this beautiful Irish accent, they'll say, because I, I served them in their life. And so I'll also serve them in their death. Wow. And it's, 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 an, it's an honor. And so yeah. that's the difference. But here dive bars are where people go get drunk on a Friday night and they don't really care there. They go eat dinner. They see their friends, they go home. You know what I mean? It's like a stop along the way. Yeah. So I've never been over to Ireland. I look forward to going one day yeah, and, and I think go. I would love the pub scene. Unfortunately, I recently kind of quit drinking beer very much. That's fine. But uh, I might have to uh, take it up still for good. travel there. Yeah, the food's still good. <laughs> and uh, and well, they, don't, yeah, they don't, you know, the thing is they don't drink like we drink. They drink, yeah, they get drunk, but it's different. It's like, there's no like, like let's do beer pong and get wasted. Right. It's like, here's some great food. Let's play darts. Let's have a pint together. Let's celebrate what we're watching. So it's a little bit. The culture is different. Anyway, same thing with the Scots. Love the Scots. I'm Irish and Scottish and Mexican, and I just love the Scots. They have the best outlook on life, and they're just happy people. Um, and, of course, I love the British too. So we're working that market, and then uh, things are going really well. So we're going to go there in November, and we're going to do radio interview performances. So it's going to be myself, Hannah, her lead guitar player, and then Hannah's assistant. So the four of us are going to go shoot a bunch of documentary footage. And then I'm going to take a bunch of meetings. And she'll be playing shows and stuff like that. Actually, they said no shows because they said the promoter said, you're going to be so busy driving all over the country because it's basically one U.S. state. It's like a small right, U.S. It's promo, state. Promo. Um, yeah. So two and three radio meet interviews per day. Yeah. So we'll show up, meet That's and exciting, greet, take man. photos. That's exciting. Play the gig. You know, it's, it's going to be really and then cool. Now, how will you guys sell? You will sell through streaming through radio play and through online sales of CDs or just uh, this, merch at shows when you go over to play? Well, again, they're not doing show. This is completely a radio promo Well, I mean, tour. when you go do a tour later or something. L- like I mean, I just, you know what? That's where it leaves me because I'd stay out of the logistics of her actual band stuff. Right, right. So because this is all about like, it's basically a press tour, cool, right? It's cool. a thank you for the DJs, but it's really exciting. And um, this is the kind of stuff that everybody really does work for when you're an independent act, because when you're thinking about trying to get signed to a label, and, you, and this would say for the producers and the mixers too, this is where the pet project is really important. If you're not nepotistically inclined towards a record label, it's not your cousin who's the A&R chief. If you didn't grow up with these people and going to go to high school and your best buddies and they're going to bring you in, if you didn't intern there and rise through the ranks, how do you break that cycle and get in? The only way to do it is to organically launch your own thing until you get it high enough that either the artist gets signs and they take you with you and now you're in – or you create such a buzz as being the next, next tastemaker that then they say, who's that cat? Let's bring him in and let's do something, him or her. Let's bring them in right. and let's get them involved because everybody wants what's hot. So Indeed. it's- yeah. <clears throat> it's Especially just, the label where they want, want to be conservative, generally speaking. Yeah, yeah. they're, they're, they're they not wanna, risk takers. Yeah. That's why you hear, you know, Bruno Mars drops a track and everybody takes a left turn. Right, they're always chasing trends. They're always doing market research. Every song right. a label releases goes to that place where they give them a score. I forget the name of it, but it's like they give it a score, and if you don't get seventy five percent approval or higher, then they don't release your album. Like there's right. there's so much stuff they do test research. Well, so let's let's spin that back on mixing real quick. Um, when you are mixing, before we get into the details of how how to make a great mix. Um, let's talk about the conceptual stuff. Okay. Do you feel like it's okay for us to um, sort of chase a sound as far as, you know, are there times where that's that's appropriate for us as mixers to go like, go after that new sound we were hearing or times where maybe that's less appropriate? Okay. This is a really interesting philosophical conversation because it has to do with your personality and what your goals are. So for me, I'm incredibly competitive. I believe there is competition in the music business among mixers, among producers, there's a lot of people out there, peers of mine, colleagues I respect, friends who say, no, there is not competition. There's enough business for everyone. And I absolutely agree. When you isolate that statement, there is enough people who want to make music that everyone can get clients who are willing to pay and everybody can pay their bills if your advertising is in place and if you run a business well. That could be social media. That could be uh, point of sale marketing. It could be um, direct mailing. It could be paid Instagram ads. There's enough business out there that everyone can get business, make money and pay their bills. And if you're not, 
podcast or your friend and trial and error and data collection. Past that basic entrepreneur, entrepreneurial skills of, of building a business, if your goals are like mine, which are conquer the world, I want to be the next great dude. Everything in my life has been building towards, I want to knock down the walls. I want to be the next Dr. Dre. I'm Dr. Ford. I want to like take on that moniker and I want, I want to be a Ken Lewis. You know what I mean? I'm never going to be a Ken Lewis. The dude's got, he's so far ahead of me, but I want to be a Ken Lewis. I want a wall full of platinum plaques. I want my Grammys. I want, I want to be a next Jack Joseph Puig with 17 Grammys on the wall. That's what I want. I want to be, I want to be 80 years old and be Al Schmidt. That's right. what I'm talking right, about, right? right? So it. if that's not your goal, this part of it you won't resonate with, and that's okay. But if it is your goal, I strongly believe it's competitive. And I say that because I absolutely go up against other Nashville mixers. Every time someone comes to me, they're interviewing four or five people. They're checking prices. They're window shopping. They're seeing who's going to do it. And Nashville notoriously undercuts each other. It, the Almost the worst thing you can do is quote your rate without knowing they adore your music yeah. because then you're going to quote your rate and they're going to like, for example, great client approached me. I bid seven songs at a certain price point. I gave them my quote. They wrote me an email back. They said, we do want to do four of them with you. However, the other three we're going to take to a buddy of mine who completely undercut my price and it's okay, but that's the competition of the business. If you don't understand that I went to a Grammy event and I shook hands with the local Nashville mixer and he, I swear to God, this happened. I was like, oh, that guy looks familiar. So I walked up and I said, hey, Daniel Ford. And he, he went, oh, and he gave me the up and down look and the nod. And he said, you're Daniel Ford. And I, and I knew exactly who he was. And I thought to myself, yeah. And I'm like, okay, this isn't my friend, right? You could just tell that I'm like, this is two sharks circling around each other. Right, right. You know what I mean? And I'm. I'm not a predator. I'm not looking to take advantage of people, but I am looking to expand and grow and evolve. Take and advantage I, of opportunity. I want the best. I want the best clients. I want to make the best records. It's just how I, it's just how okay, I. Okay. So how it. does that, what is that? Um, how does that play into sort of chasing the latest sound as a mixer? Okay. I'm glad you asked. So plagiarism is bad. Competition is excellent and it breeds excellence in my opinion. So why do the Olympics matter? Because you got a bunch of people doing the exact same thing to see who can do it better. A, a micro change in the way you throw a javelin is everything. Right. How you trained on how to get there is everything. What you ate, the coach you picked, the speedo you're wearing. Do you know what I mean? Like the genetics you were born. So you mix with. in a speedo. Nice. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, but seriously though. So when so what is the sound? First off, it is my opinion that if you're mixing for a client, you, okay, there's a, there's a phrase and I say this a lot. There's a phrase, everybody loves it called demoitis. Demoitis, in my opinion, is what mixers say when they didn't do the job acceptably correct. Why? Because here's what happens. You do a mix, you give it to the client. Uh, I really need to sound more like the rough. No, man, this sounds great. I know what I'm doing. You just have demoitis. <clears throat> Wrong. Survey says. <clears throat> Here's what actually happened. The client did the best they could with their producer. The artist and the producer did the best they could. They panned stuff where they wanted it. They got a general blend. They they put the hi-hat on the right. Oh, right. they did tr audience perspective. Ooh. They got and a then, nice balance of the energy. But hopefully. it but it it's a record. They they did the best they could and they came to you because they wanted you to take it to the next stage. They wanted to pass the torch in a um, relay race. Instead, you did not listen to the rough mix. You didn't pay attention to the fact that they did audience perspective on the drums. You didn't pay attention that the acoustic guitar is hard pan left and the electric guitar is dead center. So you listened from you pulled the stems up without ever studying the rough mix and checking out where they left off. And then you said, oh, you know what I really love? I love drummer's perspective. So you put the hi-hat on the left. And then you said, oh, you know what? Acoustic guitar, that should be in the center. And this electric guitar should be on the hard right. And then you send it back to them and you're like, here's your new mix. And they're like, this isn't my song. You didn't listen to anything. What, what happened? I, can you make it sound more like the rough? And what they really want is they want you to put the electric guitar back in the center and put the acoustic guitar on the left and flip the, flip the stereo on the drums. And then your mix 
probably sounds great. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's one of the best solutions to demoitis is take the rough track and make it a reference track in your mix exactly right. template. It's you know, exactly right. So in my mixing template, I have a dangerous monitor ST. There's four buttons on the bottom analog one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Analog one and two is my mix. I always take the rough mix and put it on three and four, and then I get one or two reference tracks. Now here's the kicker. If I'm mixing their whole album, I get the last song I mixed that they approved and I put that on output three and four, and then I'll take a secondary reference track that's competitive, but not the reference they gave me and put that on the fourth. And maybe oftentimes even more, you can bury them in playlists and then whatever. And then I can do is I hold my hand on the four buttons and I switch back and forth really quickly yeah. and I move faders and I turn pan knobs. And what you're doing is you're level balancing. You're not plagiarizing the sound what you're doing is you're letting these reference tracks guide you into the sound of a competitive mix globally. What do all of the songs on Spotify have in common? They're all within a certain tolerance because pro mixers are paying attention to what the balances should sound like. How much high should I have? How much high extension in the like air zone? How much bass should I have? How loud should the lead vocal be? How loud should the snare be it's genre specific in country music i've noticed we'd like less snare and we like less bass and more guitars right okay great but we like a more forward vocal as well well in rap music i just did a, a track i mixed for um afro any hip-hop heads out there afro afro killer track by uh, beats anonymous and then i got to work with afro which is that's really cool i love um non-commercial rap music that is killing the dude's 10 million spins on all his stuff. It's wow. awesome. Lyricism on point, like 30 second note triplet flow. I mean, it's crazy. Um, anyways. And so what did I do when I got the Afro song? I went and pulled up his highest streaming song off YouTube and I pulled it in as a reference and I got the vocal to sound the same warmth. This is how he wants to hear his vocal. This is his biggest success. So I'm competing against his last biggest release. Right. Totally. Because I want to fit into his catalog. That's not plagiarism. That's not chasing, like, it, I'm not looking to steal his sound. I'm looking to be competitive with all of his music and the industry at large. So what did I do? I beat the competition reference tracks, and I made it sound as good, if not better, than his already released songs so that when he listens to it for the first time, he's like, yep, that sounds like me. So the same thing goes for when you're mixing competitively against the world. That's the thing. It's a, it's a global competition. Do, it, can you put me in a playlist and it sounds pro you do that you're eaten. Yeah. And so chasing the sound is really paying attention to what the tolerances are. And the only way to do that is of course your acoustics and monitoring got to be on point. Or if not, you got to trust your reference tracks. Even if you think they're lying to you, it's like, no, in my room, the sides are super loud. Okay. It's cause you're on headphones or you know, uh, <laughs> this bass seems really quiet because your subwoofers turned up crazy loud, right? And so you just match those levels and trust it so that when you go to the car, you're like, oh, translates perfectly out of my studio. It doesn't matter how great it sounds in your studio. It only matters how it translates out of the room. Totally. That's why we spend so much money on $50,000 speakers and and EQ fixes and plugins and outboard rack. It's why we treat our rooms because we want it to sound the same in the room as it does outside of the room. Nobody, I strongly believe, and this is the truth, every student that comes to me, nobody printed a mix that sounded like dirt in their room. They did the best they could do and they got it to a place where like, oh, this sounds pretty good. And they hit print and they left and they take it out of the room and it sounds like dirt outside of the room. And that's why we get hired. Do you know what I'm saying? So yep. that this, this concept, the minute you accept that in someone's room, they thought it sounded good, then now we have something to work with. But if you think for a second that they printed a mix they didn't like, you failed. And that's demoitis. Yeah. That's a good tip, man. And that's a great reminder. And, um, you know, again, that, that idea that the best way to solve demoitis and the best way to deliver a mix is to take that rough mix. I've heard some mixers talk about, oh, I don't need the rough mix, you know, but I, I always love it. I, I feel like it. it's a, it's the greatest cheat ever. It's like, Give me what you got, man. It makes it a breeze to just sit there and like yeah. try and make mine sound better than that. I mean, yeah. it's not always a breeze. Sometimes it's they've got something that's really quite good and no, it's hard, to, hard you, to beat it. What if they give you the Pro Tools session file 
everybody said, no, I want you to take it all off. Okay. It's one thing if you're going to bake it into the stems. And then in that case, what I do is I say, if they're like, I'm a Pro Tools guy. So if you're using Logic or Studio One, you can't give me the session. So what I say then is I say, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to export me a a set of dry stems and I want you to give me a set of wet stems. And then what I do in my Pro Tools rig is I start with the wet I line them all up and then I do a new playlist and I pull the dries underneath all the playlists. And then I right. just start balancing it to match the rough mix. So this is one of Michael Brower's things taught through a friend of mine, Jesse Miller. Uh, he said the phrase is called meet it and beat it. So first thing you do, meet the rough mix, then you beat the rough mix. That sounds like a good inspirational that's, quote for the this podcast. Right I, have there. A, I have another one though. But meet it and beat it. That's Michael Brower. Meet it and meet it, then beat it. That's your that's your goals as a mixer. So you can't meet it if you don't have the rough mix on deck that you can switch to and listen as a reference. Yeah. And you can't beat it if you didn't listen to the rough mix because otherwise you're just doing something fresh. Your job is to take the baton and finish the race in the same direction they ran it to you as. Your job is not to take the baton kick them in the nuts, spit in their eye <laughs> and make a left turn and run a completely different I'm, direction. I'm pretty sure I actually saw that in one of my daughter's uh, <laughs> relay races in, in grade school, you know, like a kid comes up and just like, it's just makes her fall over instead of handing the baton. Right. And that's, that's that, that you don't win that race and they don't use you again because nobody wants to be told they suck. What they want you to do is, is say, dude, you guys did a great job up to this point. Now that you're going to give it to me, let me take you the rest. Let me yeah. push it the last, yeah. let's push it the last 10 feet. Oh, dude, this is great. All you need is a little bit of schmutz. And the irony is you're actually making your own job so much easier mm-hmm. because you're, you're, um, you're discovering that. And, and sometimes it's challenging the, the times where I've just made stuff a little better than where it was, you know, just, just be, meet it and beat it like that. Um, Cause sometimes you get to the end and you're like, you know, did I really, do I really push the envelope enough and everything? But then after repeatedly approaching projects that way and then then having clients come back and be like, no, we love it. It's great. It's great. Yeah. And you're like, okay, you know, maybe I should just listen to what people are telling me. Okay, if so clients I, are telling you that they love what you're doing, you, that's you know. That's the whole thing. That's a pretty good, pretty good uh, bit of feedback right there. I have a trick for that. When I'm doing a mix assessment. So, okay. So somebody sends me a mix. Hey, Dr. Ford, I want you to mix my record. Okay. What do I do? I listen to the rough mix. How much is it going to cost? Let me hear the rough mix. Why? Because I found that I don't like to, I took this approach um, from Pete Lyman at Infrasonic Mastering. Great guy. I use him a lot. Uh, Pete does not, and I'm not going to quote his prices, but Pete doesn't charge the same thing for every client. And the way he figured out is he charges by minute of length of your song. Why would you do that? Well, he does that because there's people that send him two minute punk rock songs and there's people that send him 14 minute prog rock songs. Right, totally. He doesn't feel comfortable getting paid the same amount of money for working on a 14 minute song as he does a two minute song. So he developed a system where he pays per minute length of your song rounded up. So if it's a three and a half, you pay for a four minute song. If it's two and a half, you pay for three minutes. It's it's 259, you pay for three minutes. And right. I think that he get, there's a there's a grace in there. So I think if it's like 315, you probably don't pay. Right. So, but how do you do that? And and actually the length of song matters a, a bunch in mixing as well, yeah. but also the number of tracks. Okay. Yeah. But it, remember every time you have to do a stem, every time you got to do versions, right? The difference between spending all day on something versus 20 minutes on something, right? If it's five minutes versus two minutes, the exponential addition of time. I spent all day on Friday printing final mixes with alts for somebody. And it took me seven hours to print down yep. a 10 song thing. Why? Because I had to print loud version, mix level for mastering, karaoke version with no lead vocal, instrumental version, TV track, which is an instrumental with no melody content, because what I found through the years is that um, if you're doing TV and film sync, which I've done, it, I built my career on TV and film sync, and it, they want a version of the song that has no distractions. It's all groove, no distraction. And what they do is they line all four of them up in basically in playlists, but it's different in video because they're stacked, but they li- basically line them up in playlists. And then depending on the dialogue on the scene, they switch between the versions so they right. can take elements out and because everything's at negative 30 decibels anyways, yep. right? And they're fading it in and out. And so the minute they start talking, they'll switch to the TV track, which right, is basically you don't rhythm section. don't want to section. have the lyric distracting against some yeah, dialogue. Some big old guitar going, bruh, bruh, right, bruh, yeah. and while the guy's like, you know, I really needed to talk to you. Bruh, bruh. It's, just, <laughs> yeah. it's never going to work. So I print them all these and an acapella stem and now you've got like six versions of a 14 minute track that took you an hour and a half to do versus 
six versions of a two and a half minute now, song. Now, um, just to put the, the idea out there, have you ever explored uh, whether or not you could have one template that would automatically have a whole row of stems down below and perfectly do that? Or is it one of those things where, you know, like just by, just by really complex routing in your whole mix template, or is it one of those things where you're like, you know, the time it takes me to just to make sure that that would be doing it right is the same time it's going to take me to just go ahead and print them all. Uh, if you're in the box printing, Yes, there's a, there is absolutely a template for that. And what I've figured out is, is that if a clever use of master faders tied to aux tracks, aux tracks have aux sends, you can then send um, Unity copies to uh, new analog tracks. So you could then have like a bunch of different funnels that send different things. And then you could print your mix and print the stems at the same time. A lot of people do that in the TV and film world. That's why people don't mix out of the box in the TV and film world because they're doing this on purpose because everybody wants stems, right? Because then it's going to go, especially if you're for a film, it's going to go to a team of mixers. There's usually three mixers on a film that are working on a giant console. One guy's just working on Foley, one guy's just working on score, and one guy's working on soundtrack. And, you know, some, somebody's got all the vocals for ADR and like all this, you know, Whatever, and so they're so they're well, blending. Let's clarify that real quick. So Rockstar's Foley is all the sound effects. It's the fork, and the bowl noise, and the foot foot walks on the gravel, and, and then possibly uh, dialogue too. Yeah, depends on their workflow. Music is music. Right? Yeah. Well, soundtrack versus soundtrack. score, right? Because score, score right. they're going to be mixing as they go. I mean, again, this is always going to change depending on whose workflow. But like. Okay, so if Al Schmidt mixes your score, you're probably going to treat it as a stereo file. But a lot of times those mixes are coming off of stem mastering essentially. And so they'll give you the stems and then the people in the thing, because they want to mix it all to Dolby 11.1. Right. It's a Marvel right, movie, totally. right? Yeah. So they need the individual. Yes, they wanted it mastered, but they needed the individual stuff and they're going to have it mastered as an, as a movie, which I think is bad nowadays because I see a lot of these movies and no offense to those mastering engineers, but they end up peak limiting a lot of stuff and it just, the sound isn't great. Like, well, anyways, movies I saw. are meant to have headroom. I agree. Yeah. I think so. So the then, amps. then soundtracks is um, what's that? More typically, those would be label releases that are already mastered. Gotcha, gotcha. You know what I mean? Because they're they're not getting the mixed stems. And ADR is just all the dialogue. That would be the studio recorded dialogue versus the camera recorded dialogue right. or on set right, dialogue. Totally. Um, but you're going to have multiple people mixing that on one giant console. That's why we had 96 channel consoles. Yep. Nobody yep. needs 96 and, channels. And you know, one in of the uh, sources for those big consoles is right here in Nashville. It's Harrison mm. consoles. Yeah. A lot yeah. of them do digital now, too. And that's really the key. And of course, Avid, uh, you know, they have all of their main technology is the medium com media composer stuff. That's why everybody bags on Pro Tools a lot, is because it doesn't get the priority at Avid. You know, it, it's second because the big money for them is the media composer stuff and everything for TV and film mixing. Uh, because those people have the budget to buy new gear all the time, whereas a studio owner spending $100,000 on a console, you better be banking $500,000 a year. Recording Studio Rockstars Academy is the place you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything else. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. All right, so so in that film world, you have these very complicated um, stems and masters, but in the music world, um, we still get asked for stems a lot. Um, I guess you're saying that there's a distinction between if you're mixing through outboard gear- Which I am. Then you're going to probably be limited in how many fancy routings you can do all at once. I can't capture the individuals because I'm using multiple multiple um, steps of compression at different groups to create sound. So for example, I'm using analog summing. So I've got a dangerous two bus plus that has some stuff happening in parallel on the drum bus. I, the bass goes through some harmonic content generation, second and third order harmonics that I have and then a little bit of distortion. And then I also have a compressor on the, um, I've got an API 2500 on my stereo drum bus. And then I've got um, a couple 500 series units compressing different subgroups of audio. And then all of those go into a, a bus which has the external input off of the two bus plus. And that has um, parallel compression 
and it's running through a backseat queue. I have a pretty elaborate setup, so right, I totally. have to just go through and I have to print it seven times if you want seven stereo stems. Well, well, we're uh, on the the back half of the podcast here. We're going to still we'll talk about. We're going to insist yeah. that you tell us how we could do it in the box too. But sure. I think it'll be great to um, sort of do some comparative okay. notes and really so begin to understand it too. Let's pull back to how do I charge? So what I found is, and that's a good end of this segment, is that because of Pete's influence, I realized different genres of music have a different competition. Business, let's talk business for a second. No hip hop guy who downloaded a least beat for 35 bucks off the internet and recorded his studio uh, vocals, maybe even into a laptop speaker directly without, or a USB mic or at his buddy's house in the closet is going to pay $750 to have you mix his song. Right. It's totally. not going to happen. Right. They want the lowest price possible. That sounds good because it's a mixtape and they're not earning any money on streams. So you have to be genre competitive price wise nationally. Right. That's the first step. This is business like 101. Like it is competitive. If you don't understand these things, then people are going to keep coming to you window shopping. Hey, man, how much is it going to cost? Six hundred dollars to mix your downloaded least beat vocals. Okay, but let's talk about that for real. What did it mean? Oh, I didn't have to melodyne anything. I didn't have to edit anything. I couldn't mix the track because it's a downloaded MP3. So the best I could do is get a plug in on it that helps some high end come back in. The Zymnaptic one, by the way, is the there's a on MP3 one, Z Y N A P T I Q, Zynaptic. It's expensive, but it does one thing really well. And it like goes in and it figures out all the errors from an MP3 and it resynthesizes the lost data. Flipping Good awesome. Lord. Zynaptic with a Q and a Y. Zynaptic. Um, and uh, so, okay, so you, you run that. Ooh, it sounds better. And then you do a little light EQ to like fix or maybe some mid-side compression or you do a little light mastering on the on the two track, downloaded Beastly, Beast, Beat Lease. And then what are you going to do? You're going to throw the vocal into 1176, put some EQ on it, a little reverb, and that's the best you can do on this record because it's not incredibly dynamic. It's a rap record and he's probably hitting the same dynamic range for the entire three and a half minutes. You pan some stuff. You add a little sweetener, you're done. So what I've found is is that I like to work in fractions of a day. So the first thing I do is say, hey, what's the condition of the files? Oh, it's uh, vocals over a two track. Great. For me, two hours, done. I know what my price is for that. I charge them for two hours. I'll usually put an extra hour in on anything because I have my own internal quality control and brand that I have standards for. But generally speaking, two hours for that. If it's a full rap track out, I've noticed that rap beats – don't require a lot because producers who are making rap beats are mixing as they go. So usually with a rap beat, the first thing you need to do is fix the bass because people did it on a laptop or EQ, uh, sorry, did it on a laptop with headphones. And so the EQ for the room wasn't great. And so they'll usually just do wacky stuff with bass. So like kicks and really subby kicks or they'll layer a bunch of stuff. So for a, a rap track out, I spend the most of my time fixing phase on layered kick drums and then getting them to EQ work together so it's punchy, not flubby. And then getting the bass to sit right because usually people have pokey outy notes. Um, pokey outy notes. Right? That's, we, I thought we invented those over here. I know. <laughs> the uh, the pokey outy notes. And then you just got to gotta deal with those. But once you do with that, then it's just usually balancing panning. It's fast. So if I got a full rap track out, I give them a four hour thing. If I've got a record that somebody sends me and say it's a rock record, all the post-production is done. No editing, no tuning vocals. For me, four-hour record. I take a little bit more time with live instruments because they take a little bit more time. If I got to do time alignment on a drum kit, if I got to do sample layering, if I got to do all the stuff we do on a rock record, that's it's it's different because live recordings have a lot more re-engineering they require than a synthesized set of tracks and right, samples. Right, totally, because live acoustical instruments that are captured by a microphone just tend to have more natural dynamic that really has to be yeah. wrangled in. And resonant frequencies yeah. and anomalies from the acoustic of the room yeah. and things that you're Corrective like- Corrective EQ. Yeah, that's what JJP called it, re-engineering, and I think it's good because these are things you would have fixed in the moment if you were there, you would have, you would have heard it coming out the monitors. You would have been like, oh, there's a weird thing happening right there. Let me go put a baffle up. Right. Right. You would have done that, but they didn't do it. So you got to use plugins to do it or creative uh, editing with fades. So um, anyway, so so I'll, so I'll usually do like a, a no post-production um, and that's a term I use for that. I, I, I try not to say insulting things to clients such as you really need me to tune your vocals. You're really out of pitch and your groove right, right. is bad. So yeah. instead I use really neutral words like 
nobody did post-production for you because people right. like film. They get it. They get, oh, post-production, that's where they like do color correction and things like that, right? Editing and color correction. So I'll say, you really need post-production on this. So it's four hours to get the mix sounding good. And then since it's only a lead vocal and like one background vocal, give me two hours and I'll do all the vocal post Melodyne. Right. And do some groove editing. Because, you know, you horizontally time stuff in Melodyne too, right? So I'll do all that. And so give me an extra two hours. So here's six hours if I got a tune of vocal. But then if you're an R&B record and you've got 24 to 32 background vocals and I got to go in there and tune them all, I want a full eight hours. But if I think that you are someone with a budget, I might ask for eight hours. And then here's the key question. When I'm doing this, I'll say to them, and this goes back to our previous segment, there's two types of mixing. There's balancing mixing, what I would call corrective mixing, that is just getting you globally competitive on a sonic level. Does let me just get you sounding pro. And then there's artistic mixing. I have a phrase that I invented, coined, called lyrical mixing. And I think we briefly talked about this, but we can talk about it today. It's a philosophy that goes beyond a competitive mix. Once you get your mix competitive, globally competitive, and it would be great as it is, you have the opportunity to then go back and do lyrical mixing. And so what is lyrical mixing? Lyrical mixing is the art of being a mixer. It's, um, for me, the I won the PMA Mark Award. That's the Production Music Association Mark Award 2018. Uh, Brett Boyette, who's a writer and producer in town, amazing guy. Uh, he was the artist. I mixed, I did all the post-production and mixed his record. It was with Megatrax. They went to the PMA Awards last September. We won Best Country Artist for the album I mixed for him. So I got a gold statue. It's the, it's on my desk. Nice. It's really cool. It was my first, like what I would consider good industry award and uh, what we might consider like a tier two award, right? If the Grammys are a tier one Emmys or tier one. So that record was one of the ones where I actually really, really defined lyrical mixing for myself. We made it in 2016. It didn't get released on Megatracks till 2018. And then it was introduced. So a lot of times this, this stuff sits on the shelf. And so I had gone to mix with the masters in 2014. JJP stirred my brain around. 2015 was evolving and really trying to figure out everything that he taught me and how I was growing after that, because they basically plant all these seeds and it takes a minute for the the fruit to grow. And then a lot of people will tell you that a lot of mix with the masters uh, attendees will say, it took me about a year to really recover from all of that information. And then after a year, I started kicking ass. And it, that's exactly what happened with me. 2015 was rough and I failed a bunch of things because I thought I was like, I thought I knew it. And I was like cocky and I was like, yeah, I got all these new concepts. And like, I remember this one mix this guy gave me and I spent a week, um, I won't name the guy, but he was, he's a producer in LA in Hollywood. And, and he gave me, he was like, I'm looking for a new go-to mixer. And he gave me a reference track and he's all, and he gave me his mix session. And, and I, he said, I want you to make it sound like this. The first one's a test. If you get it, I'll start shooting you all my songs. And I was nice. like, great, let's go. I just come back to mix the masters three or four months ago. I was like ready to go. And I was like, yeah, I got this. I spent, I swear to Jesus, 40 hours working on that mix. And for the life of me, I could not get it to sound anywhere close to the rough, to the reference mix. And he kept emailing me like, bro, you should have been done in like five hours. And I couldn't figure it out. And I was remixing. I wasn't mixing. And the distinction there is really important. I hadn't figured out all the stuff I'm talking to you. I didn't just balance the record like the ref track and say, oh, those guitars aren't bright enough. Brighten them up. I sat there and I remixed from the stems and I did the thing I wasn't doing. And so he was right, like, you, you forgot to use it right in that reference. I just didn't get it. I spent 40 hours and finally I sent him the mix and I was like, here's the best I can do. And he was like, yeah, we all listen to this and it, it ain't good enough and right. sorry. And that was the end of it. And so I could have fired back, but I tend to not, I'm pretty accountable for my own faults. And so it, what I've learned through relationship counseling and, um, now do um, you think it might've been appropriate at that time to just say, you know what? I just couldn't beat it. Thanks for letting me try and not even send him the mix. Well, the, no, I've never done I that. Had, I've never not uh, sent somebody something, but I, I wonder my, no, I wanted the job and I thought I, I thought my mix sounded good. And of course I sent it out to a couple of buddies and was like, is this not a good mix? And they're like, yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. His production sucked. Can I just say that <laughs> in, in hindsight, three years later, I've, I've often gone back to this cause I've always wondered, maybe I should go try and mix this again, just for my own edification and my own 
understanding of self-value. I went back and listened to it. It's horrible. You know why I couldn't mix it? Because his production sucked. Right. And I hate to say that, but it's like the reference track he sent me was like a- Was well-produced. It was mixed by, it was incredibly well-produced and mixed by a platinum mixer. Right. And the, totally. and it had totally. an incredible uh, LV, that's a singer, E-L-L-E, LV. She was the vocalist on it. She's amazing. Oh, she's so, so she's hilarious. Great. flipping incredible vocalist. And so like, he gave me this chick that couldn't sing- who he sold based on that reference track. He did a, a horrible sound alike job. The synth programming was like, he spent like two hours on it. But, but also like before we actually feel like we're pointing fingers, let's turn those fingers right around on us. It's one of the lessons we have to learn as producers that, you know, the, the concept of you can't, this is what they told us in school is like, you can't polish a turd. You just, you just keep going and going and eventually just get shit everywhere. Yeah. You know? So it's like, you have to have, the um, it's it's at the the point at which you capture the sounds that you really need to get the very very best recorded and make sure that your production really has the mix in mind while you're producing it, and then it allows it to be much much easier to make the mix sound great. You know, four years later, I absolutely could have murdered that mix. Now, if you gave me that mix now, I would have gotten it way 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 closer. The problem is is that. You know, I, I just, I, I wasn't, I wasn't as good as I am now. So yes, the production wasn't great. I still would have murdered that. If you gave it to him tomorrow, I'd be like, yeah, no problem. And I would have done everything I didn't do then. Awesome. Well, Rockstars, we're going to take a break now for the jam session. When we come back in, Dr. Ford is going to give us some of those tips that are going, that you, that might take, hopefully it won't take you four years, but it might <laughs> just yeah, to put them know. into, put them into effect. And um, we'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Of course, there's links to everything we're talking about in the show notes, including a link to drford.com. Not that that's very hard to remember, um, but also YouTube playlist and uh, and some and videos playlist. right there and Spotify playlist. So it'll be in the in the blog post. So we'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Cheers. It was 1971 in a New York City basement when Eventide revolutionized the audio world by introducing the world's first studio effects processor, the Instant Phaser, and the first digital effect, the H910 Harmonizer. Eventide soon followed with the Instant Flanger, Omnipressor, SP2016 Reverb, and H949 and H3000 Harmonizers, which have been favorites of A-list mixers like Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mick Kozowski, and Dave Pensato, and heard on countless hit records over the decades. Today, Eventide brings all that sound to your stage and studio with modern solutions like the H9000 Harmonizer, their complete line of guitar pedals, including the versatile H9 Max, and transformative plugins like Micropitch, Physion, Black Hole, and Mangled Reverb. Take your next mix in your studio to a whole new level. Go to eventide.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you sick of bothering family and neighbors when you're just trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises or computer fans get into your studio mics and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio can easily cost up to $100,000 or more. Trust me, I know. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish it was an easy solution right now? Quisp Room Isobooths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated isobooth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Quisp Room has been solving studio isolation needs worldwide with isobooths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio, practice whenever you want, and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booths when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? 
Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and Studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, rock stars! We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Daniel, aka Doctor Four, joining us to talk about making great records, touring in faraway places with with your own uh, love projects. Um, and we're gonna dig into mixing now. So, yes. you ready to jam, dude? I'm ready to rock. Ready to rock and jam. Oh, all right, cool. Are you ready to mix? I'm that's, ready to that's mix. That's the real question. Do it. Throw and go, baby. All right, dig it. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you as we kick this off for another inspirational quote too. I know you had something cool for us. I and, do. Uh, why don't okay. we start with that? So, I wish you guys could see it, but I'll send Liz the um, the photo. So, my grandfather, uh, may he rest in peace. He probably be in his late nineties at this point, but he's he's passed away. He died of Alzheimer's when I was um, eighteen. I am now turning thirty nine. So he's been gone for quite a while. I never really knew him, and um, because he had my entire uh, teenage years, he had Alzheimer's. So he was there, but he wasn't there. So anybody right. who feels that, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I love my grandfather. I was the youngest cousin, and so you know, it. I didn't know him. That said. He worked for Shell Oil way back when in the 30s, 40s, right? And so he was literally a door-to-door salesman and he had this thing called the magic barrel and he was selling petroleum products and he was, you know, he was a suit. He was like a vacuum salesman, but he sold Shell Oil. So he wasn't going to people's homes. He was going to like, I guess originally he was trying to get um, service stations and stuff like that, like built in. Okay. So I have his vinyl collection and in his vinyl collection is all these really trippy vinyls of like sales stuff oh, where there's yeah. like, it's like, um, how to develop your dynamic potential. That's and, in the Ray Kroc movie too, where the founder of McDonald's, he listened to vinyl records in his hotel room. To get I have those. Up. I have the whole thing. And some of the edges are chewed by the old uh, dogs. They had a bunch of dash hounds and, and, uh, or dachshunds or whatever. Uh, one of them was named Schmutzy. I have seen photos and, uh, anyways, and so I have a button. I found a button when I was doing the the collection, when my grandmother was selling her, her family home and she was going to move into my mom's house so my mom could see her through the last years of her life. And it was a wonderful choice. She fought it for so long. And after a year, she said, why did I fight this? She got to wake up and have coffee with my mom and we were there. So- So you I found, found a button. This, you I like found a button. The, the estate? It's literally a, a button you pin to your collar. And it literally says- Nothing happens until someone sells something. Okay. So I pinned this next to my coffee machine at the studio because it's like the burlap studio acoustic felt. And so I just kind of stuck it in and it sits there and I look at it every day. And why is this important to me? Well, first off, we are in the service industry. I worked in restaurants coming up when I was, you know, working nights so I could mix during the day as I was developing everything. My start was in real estate. I apprenticed under my mother who um, at one point was the number 14 real estate agent in America. She's a powerhouse, amazing. And I watched her work um, and I and I saw her, the, you know, the business of real, selling real estate as a real estate agent is very similar to the way that we work. They rent an office at a brokerage. I rent a studio at a studio complex. Mm -hmm. they, they keep all their own books. They have all their own marketing. They go out and they help their clients do that thing and get them into a home. We make a record and help you get on with your life. It's very similar in all aspects, taxes, income statements, accounting, uh, accountability. And so I'm big on that. And so I've modeled my business after what I learned from apprenticing under my mother. I got my real estate license. Um, and so I don't have it anymore, but I did. And the essence is that nobody hires you to mix until you've sold them. You have to sell your service to, right, to them. Right. Nobody comes to your studio unless you sold your studio to them. So we have to remember that 
you are in a people serving business. You have to market your business. You have to sell yourself and people got to like you and want to work with you. They got to like the sounds you get. And so the quote is nothing happens until somebody sells something. And if you don't understand that you are in a sales business, then you're constantly going to be beating your head against the wall. Well, very cool, man. I love that kind of quote. I love that inspiration to get out there and really connect with opportunities yep. to do this, you know, creative thing that you love to do. And so now that you've sold somebody on coming to you to mix, let's dig into some of the ways that you can make sure that that mix is sounding great. And, you know, for a lot of our listeners too, they may just be mixing for themselves. That's it's still going to apply too. to you, rock stars. Just making sure your, your recordings and your mixes sound killer. I love when people are mixing for themselves. And I think every mixer should always have a side project because what do you do when you're mixing not for a client? You make abstract art. Yeah, indeed. You, you take risks and you try things yeah. out and you have fun with it and you're playful. Because you're not bound by the by the the machine, right? Well, let's begin by talking a little bit about what your studio is like now. Okay. When you're mixing, what kind of a studio layout do you have? What do you what what sort of monitors do you listen to? Um you talked about mixing in and out of the box and stuff like that, but describe the your setting a little to us. Okay, so one of the things that was really important to me, knowing our lovely co, our lovely lovely host and all of the struggles he's been through, is that I did not want to move back to Nashville and deal with any of that. You're uh, talking about my home studio battle, right? I'm here. talking about all that, and yeah, so totally. respect. And so I knew that was going on. I'd done my research, and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm just going to avoid this entirely because the last thing I can do when I'm trying to feed my family is have to deal with that that struggle that 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 Liz is going through. So um, I said, okay, I'm going to get a commercial room somewhere and avoid it entirely. Now, anybody listening needs to know that Nashville has an extreme shortage of rooms that you can lease at all, like. It's ridiculous how many rooms there aren't. Like, it's so hard. And so I spent months on the internet searching and finally found the room I have now at the Sound Kitchen Studio C. And there are no more rooms for, for lease there. There's one little tiny baby shoebox room, which I think was built as a mastering room, but it's really just somewhere to, like, meet a client and record a vocal. It's it's a tiny box. Right. Um, and so I got the original mixing suite. So originally there was all these different rooms at the sound kitchen. They were all tracking rooms. And then there was two producer suites. One of them was the owner at the time in the nineties who built it for himself. It's got a much more elaborate private entrance and it's got like Osbergs in the wall, really nice ones. And it's just, it's just a little bit more, it's got a raised. I think that's the one I've seen. Yeah. yeah that's like studio big, D. big live room, right? When you look no, through no the live room no. on that one. So the okay. studio D has the same booth that I have, which is essentially like a really small drum kit booth but it has a raised producer's dais in the back. And a, this is and a your room or this, this is, is Studio one? D. And so right. currently Billy Smiley is in this room. Dig it. I had an option to get that one, but instead I opted for the one next door, which is Studio C. Studio C, when I moved in at a 96 channel um, SSL 4000 uh, G plus in there, but no outboard rack. Now, I said, get that thing out of here. No disrespect. And everybody would love to have a SSL 4000 G plus like Chris or algae. I would not, you know why? Because I have no interest in recall and neither does Chris Lord algae. I don't know if anybody's really studying him, but he doesn't use the faders on that console anymore because all the knobs recall to a TV. So he can save the recall for the knobs, but you can't necessarily, unless you have an elaborate motorized fader thing, and then you got to do all the, the fader re, re, like recording and, it's a real pain in the butt. So Chris Ordalgi has that thing that he uses where he uses the aux sends and because he can match the send level with the recall thing. And then all of his outboard gear doesn't change level. And Chris Ordalgi would say, I'd rather have five 1176s with different levels of input and output so I can hit them harder depending on which one I go to than have to redial the knobs because when you every time you want to switch songs or if a client comes in and says, let's make a change – you have to spend hours doing recall and it never right, comes totally. back the same. Totally. So what did you choose? I went for a hybrid setup with minimal recall. And so I subscribed to Browerizing. So Michael Brower, uh, Coldplay, so many great records. Michael Brower has, in my opinion, invented stem mastering. He just didn't know that he was doing that. So anybody who needs to learn about stem mastering, there's some really great videos by uh, Mike Wells Mastering and dangerous music. They got together and Mike talks about what stem mastering is. The essence of stem mastering is exactly browerizing. You have subgroups of audio that you compress and EQ 
as groups because the way that the groups of audio hit thresholds and interact from the compressor gives it a rhythm, gives it a mojo, gives it a vibe, gives it a sound, gives it harmonic content, gives it character. And so using different compressors to do different jobs, what you're looking for is you're looking for a type of compression that happens as a signature sound from the compressor. Plus you're looking for a signature harmonic and EQ structure that gives that compressor the vibe you want and the tone you want. And you want different ones so that when you stack them all together in summing, things stand out, right? We all know the concept of phantom center is that the same sound played out of both speakers sums mono and it feels like it's coming out of the center. This is one of the things when you're doing recording uh, a producer, you're recording guitars. The old trick is never record a double on the same guitar. If you want a hard left guitar and a hard right guitar, switch guitars. If you can't switch guitars, switch pickups. If you can't switch pickups, switch amps. If you can't switch amps, switch microphones because you have to have a different harmonic structure somewhere in there. Otherwise, what's going to happen is, is if your electric, electric guitar player is hella tight, then you're going to have this audio that's the same harmonic structure and it's going to sum to mono and you're going to be like, okay, then I have to result to a stereo widener. I have to add phase. I have to do all these things which essentially degrade your sound. Here in Nashville, guitars are so dominant in a mix I keep a Telecaster in the studio. I have a secondary Telecaster. So if I got, need to get one still. Just get you, I, I reckon, you know what's great is those like 90s Mexi fenders. Yep, yep, totally. They're like 400 bucks. Go pick some up. Just get a Strat, a Telecaster, and a Les Paul studio. Like get those three things in your studio, even if you don't play guitar. And what happens is keep them fresh strings, keep them clean, keep them in tune, get them set up properly, spend the 100 bucks. And then like, what happens is, is that this, the guitar player will come in, the session guitar player comes in with their whole massive rack of pedals and they'll get their sound. I used to tell them, they would say, hey, do you want reverb and, and, and delays and stuff? And I'd be like, no, I can do that in the box. I stopped doing that. You know why? I still can do that in the box, but I can never recreate the really intricate sounds they get from these pedals because guitar players are tone chasers. They, yeah. they spend all this time doing crazy stuff to get these vibe and sound they get. And then you tell them not to do it because you think you can do it with plugins. Right. You can't right. just record the pedals. All right. all right. And then I say, they, I'm like, that's great. You know what? I would love to get a double of that here. Switch guitars. If they don't have another Telecaster and the Strat doesn't sound as good because it doesn't have the twang from the metal, um, at the back, you know, I'm talking about the, what the plectrum or whatever that like metal cup, then that's where I say, here, just grab my telly. And then they plug it in and they play and the wood grain is different. And yeah, that's- they sound different. And, and so you get more of you a distinct left and right sound, They're a wider sound naturally. Yeah. Because when you do the same one, they, because of what you said, because they sound so similar, it starts to sound like a phantom guitar in the yeah. middle. Yeah, you lose and diction, then, you lose detail. And then, yeah. so what do we do? And it just takes that guitar that you loved so much and pushes it back in the mix. Yeah, well. or it gets phasey. Now you've put a phaser on it that you didn't intend. I mean, then we're talking about mixing. It's really important to understand So, this. So you, in your studio, you've got a spare guitar around, which is cool as a solution to that. But um, you're using an outboard uh, summing amp, like the like the Dangerous Audio. Yeah, to, the Dangerous 2 Bus Plus. So, so well, I, I describe sort of quickly, um, what's the balance um, between stuff that you do in the box with plugins and Pro Tools, and you're mixing off Pro Tools, right? Yeah, I'm a Pro Tools. Okay, guy. and then what what happens outside the box? Okay, so my approach to mixing is individual faders get plugins because I want recall. That's my approach. So all the stuff I can do, what I'll do is if I like, if I say, hmm, this vocal really should have been run through my Neve 1084. Okay, I'll go out there and I'll pass it through and I'll sweeten it up and then I'll re-record it onto a playlist and then I name the playlist so I have the before and after. Okay, that's great. So if I'm going to do that, I'm not, I don't use hardware inserts because I just don't care. I don't want to deal with the recall. Right. So totally. Because what am I doing? I'm moving quickly and I know that nobody's going to ever say, hey, can I get a little bit less of that 1084? They're not going to say that. They want, can I get a little less bass? Sure, add a little EQ on it. No big deal. So the thing is like that, I'd rather not deal with hardware inserts. I'm minimizing recall. I know I want to pass it through. It's harmonics, it's saturation, it's a little sweetening EQ. So I just pass it through, re-record it, done. Then it's on a new playlist. So then I'm just going to work as much as I can at the fader level in the box. Then in my Pro Tools setup, I have um, eight stereo masters. Those masters, if I was going to do the TV film in the box mixing to make stems, I have a separate template that those masters would be hidden and there would be an, a stereo aux track in their place. You can, you can do that where the master and the aux share the same in and out. 
I mean, if you've seen that, that's a whole thing. So that used to be the way to get a better resolution because uh, auxes, if I'm not mistaken, were 32-bit float. A master's a 48-bit hard uh, on the bit depth. So you could get better resolution on the master faders for summing and all that, but that's a separate conversation. So we don't really deal with that anymore because I'm running a 64-bit operating system uh, and I run at 32 float as the whole session. So I just roll with it. It sounds great. I don't deal with that. That's what I do too. I'm, I do uh, 3296 as much as mm. I can right now. I would love to be on 96, but on my older Macintosh, um, it just gets laggy because then you, the oversampling on the plugins and everything goes crazy. And it's only because I'm using an older Mac. I have a 2010 Mac Pro that's pimped out, but it's now it's coming to the end of its life. So I'm looking to do a Hackintosh later, yeah. but that's a separate conversation yeah. as well. So eight stereo master faders. And they're named A drums, B bass, C music one, D music two, E music three, lead uh, uh, F lead vocal, G background vocals, and H effects returns. So all of my sendable, uh, you know, things where you'd use an aux send off a lead vocal to get some instead of an insert reverb. The return of all those effects I keep on the far left of my Pro, of my Pro Tools rig because I like them at the top of my edit window. And those effects returns all go to the eighth stereo bus. So if I need to compress or filter them, I can at the master fader. Or if I'm like, you know what, all around I want a little more effects, I can just pull that master fader up a dB and a half. Or if the client says, it's a little too wet, I, I don't have to go to the aux sends and right. change everything. I just grab the fader and pull it down a dB. How's that? Sounds great. Okay. Then lead vocal goes to the lead vocal bus. Background vocals go to the background vocal bus. So if I've got 20 tracks of background vocals, usually I've got aux tracks in the middle that are like sub funnels because I'm going to compress and EQ them as in small batches. But then those batches with other layers, say you have a batch for each note in the harmony. So that way I'm mixing on it's a three-part harmony. I have three stereo faders instead of 24 faders. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to use the- Low, middle, high notes or sure. something like that. And then, uh, so then I'm going to use the uh, the um, the master fader output as a group for those three notes so that I can then get them sitting right. And maybe I use a little compression and EQ to kind of make that all gel together. Then uh, those would be in the box. But I also have analog compression outboard. So what I do typically is- C bus music one will be all music. And so I start with all music except melodies and solos. So what I'm not looking for is anything that's a theme, uh, anything that should be up the center, anything that's a, like the general of a song. Right. And we talked about this briefly on our last podcast, but Jack Joseph, Puig taught me that there's typically three parts to a mix there's the the lead, the general that trades between lead vocals, guitar solos, or whatever uh, melodic concepts. If it's an EDM song, it might be a, a music break, and then it's a big, you know, whatever the, the lead melody is. Then you have a counter melody, just like you do in um, counterpoint theory, uh, orchestral mixing, and then you have the orchestra or the rhythm section, right? So, like, what is the rhythm section? Kick, snare, bass, all the pads all your electric guitars that are kind of low, your acoustic guitar, anything that's keeping the song going and rolling, but isn't something you're supposed to be specifically paying attention to. You're supposed to be listening to the lyrics of the song. And so the reason is, is that when you're mixing into compression, one of the biggest mistakes people make, and I want you to take notes on this rock stars, is that Chris Ordalgi and all these guys have said, here's what I do, but you don't know why they're doing it. And you don't know that they've done all these other things before they've done it. And so Chris Lordalgy and uh, even Tom Lordalgy too, they say like, well, I'm always mixing through the SSL bus compressor and it'll hit, you'll be looking at it and it's hitting negative five or whatever like that. Okay. So the part that you don't understand is that they're doing a lot of stuff in the background. Maybe it's in parallel. Maybe they've got transient enhancers. Maybe they're, anyways, they're just so evolved as mixers that they're hearing minuscule dynamics and things that they can then tweak that you can't hear and you don't have 40 years of experience and a bazillion hit records and you're just not hearing it. So what I get, I'll get a lot of these kids that are coming to me and they're like, Hey, will you listen to my mix and give me a critique? And they send it to me 
and they put an SSL bus compressor on the master and they mixed into it. Oh, I love to mix into compression and they mixed into it. And that compressor was hitting negative seven, negative eight, whatever DB but on everything. And it just sounds like the whole record is the smoothest pillow of audio I've ever heard. And it's big and loud, but there's no intricacy dynamics. There's no release. There's no space between notes anymore. There's no 3D depth. There's nothing but a just pillow of sound that feels squishy and boring. Right. Totally. And, and so what's exciting? What moves your feet? Transients. Yep. So we have to have a situation where you have enough transients in your mix that get the rhythm into the record. And then you have to have enough sustain that your RMS values, root mean squared, the average energy of your record is loud. And then you have to have enough peaks and transients that you move the speaker cones. And then you have to have enough peak limiting that none of those um, peaks that and transients that you had uh, go so loud that when you bring the gain up, they distort. You know what I mean? It's this crazy juggling show. And if you just start by mixing through compression on the master bus, it is my opinion that you are severely handicapping yourself when instead you could follow the browarizing concept. So drums will get a little bit of compression. Why? Because I want the tone from an API 2500 because I want the bump from the 2520 op amp. Uh, I want it to impart a tonality, but I also want that really interesting 2500 um, thrust and the uh, link between the sides that I love. I love it on 50%. It's looking at half the dual mono and half stereo. It's killer on drums. And then the other thing the API 2500 is killer on is you turn it really fast. It's killer at, at overhead mics. Why? Because it, what it'll do is basically compress the snare, right? Because you've got a direct mic on the snare. I don't need the overhead. I'd rather take the transient out of the overheads and just boost up a parallel transient on the snare drum so I can put as much as that snap in as I want. But so that's my drums and, and my drum bus is getting a parallel 1176 from the two bus plus it's built in circuit. So I can bring all the air and the punch of the room up on a parallel knob. So I'm getting a little squish from the top and a little flood from the bottom and my sound. This is where we get into mixers say I have my sound. Well, what's my sound? My sound is a set of balances that I like in my music, every song I mix. So my API 2500 drum compressor is set on my drum bus so that when I push the stereo fader on the master, I get my drum balance the way I want inside Pro Tools. Then I grab the output and I shove it up until I'm touching the API 2500 and it's just tickling the needle and I get maybe a half a dB of compression because that's already been compressed. I could compress it with a plug in if I wanted to. So let me, let me see if I can clarify that. So um, that little bit of compression in the API 2500, but it's also, you said there was a parallel thing going on with an 1176 or something. So you're getting like, you're kind of hitting a couple of different compressors at once and it's, and it's summing together to give you the sound that you like. Yes. So two things are happening. One, I am getting a little bit of gentle bounce from the compressor when the kick and the snare hit, right. Which pumps the rest of the audio down a little bit, right. So that it emphasizes, cause you have to understand with, with, Stereo compressors with dual mono compressors. Compressors are broadband unless they're multiband compressors. So a lot of young kids think if I push a, a group of audio into a compressor, then the kick drum hits, then everything else gets louder and the kick drum gets squashed. That's not true. That only happens in a multiband compressor, right? Because it's looking at a frequency range. In a subgroup that's compressing a lot of things at the same time, whatever loudest item hits the threshold, the compressor says, oh, you wanted that quieter held. So it reduces everything in stereo broadband evenly. And the effect is that the kick drum or whatever stays in the same place and everybody else reduces in gain. Right, right, totally. Right, compressors pin things in their place unless you over compress. And that's when you start to get into sound design, but that's different. So in, cause you have, compression that you're trying to just regulate dynamics, the general rule is we do what we can get away with versus sound design, which is how can I mangle this to make it sound different? Totally different schools of thought. General mixing and balances is what can I get away with before it sounds weird? Right. I feel like general mixing and balancing is about trying to um, enhance the energy that's already existing in the tracks as much as possible 
And sometimes you get really creative with it. And sometimes you're like, oh, I'm going to freak this sound out. But more often than not, you, I, I discovered that decision should have been made at the production stage. Fair. And that's a good place for it because you, you get a sense of whether something's going to work like that or not. Well, and that's when we get into artistic mixing. And that's uh, we're going to sidetrack here. But the question I love to ask my people is, how much clinical mixing do you want? How much artistic mixing do you want? What do you mean? Well, do you want me to throw weird stuff on sounds and mangle them and turn them into other things? Yes. Great. Give me a day and a half instead, yeah, of, totally. instead of four hours. And totally. I'll just go wild. I got all these crazy rack gears. I'll put it out of speaker cabinet into a Leslie and I'll mic it up and we'll do crazy stuff. I need time and budget so I can get I'll creative. I'll re the snare drum out there. Exactly. Or no, we love the production exactly. Okay, you just want me to like ice the cake? Great. We'll push it the last 10 feet. And so you understanding what the client wants tells you how creative you should get. Yeah. But my sound is not that sound. That creative sound is organic inspiration. It's energy in the air that you just try stuff and you roll with it. My sound is back to what I was saying. I like drums at a certain volume. How do I know that I clicked the same level of monitors? So I know that what I'm hearing out of the monitors isn't arbitrary. Well, I got a hashtag on my monitor wheel. So I turn it up to the hashtag and I know that that's the calibrated level I should be listening to. Then I have an API 2500 stereo compressor on my drum bus and I push my drums into it until it's tickling the meter. And then I know my drums are in the right balance position. Now, how did you arrive at this hashtag? Is there anything that we can, is that like a, a long complex process to figure out what that is? Or are, are there a couple of quick takeaways for the, us? The quick takeaway is, is that if anyone has anybody listening on monitors, first, you have to understand that there's two things that are really important. 90 decibels is where hearing loss starts, hearing damage and hearing loss starts. 90 decibels, SPL, C weighted. And 85 de decibels, depending on who you talk to and how far away from the speakers you are, up to 87 and a half decibels uh, is where the Fletcher Munson curve is flat. Right. Okay. Good, good tips. And let's just help clarify that for the rock stars too. That, you know, for those of you who are scratching your head and going, well, where do I measure 85 and where do I measure 90? That is the sound has left the speaker to you and it's coming to your ear now. So you have to measure it at your ear, which means this is not a thing you look at a meter on the screen for. Nope. This is, you get, um, I still have my original Radio Shack, you know, nine volt battery Perfect. SPL meter. You can just hold that up where your ear is, but you all have phones now. So yeah. your phone, and, there's yeah. the, there's an app out there that you can download that's just an SPL meter. It's called SPL meter. It's like two bucks. I strongly recommend it. And it's already calibrated for the iPhone speaker. And again, close is close enough when you're coming to this, right? You just want to get it in the zone. So here's the process. You put your chair where you want it to be and you set your phone on the back headrest where approximating where your head would be and the microphone is your ears. Then you want to take a, pl a signal generator plug in and set it to negative 18 decibels RMS pink noise. Then you want to solo or just turn one off, put it up mono, and then you want to um, pan or, or pan it left or turn off the other speaker and you want to check one speaker first. And you're going to turn your volume knob up until your SPL meter on the phone reads 87 and a half dB SPL. And then you want C weighted. C weighted is how our ears hear. Okay. And that's really important because there's three A, B, and C. One of them scientific. One of them's in the middle. The C has a little more base to it. Right, than a, just C is like how we hear. That's I, what I just remember is that you just, that's the one you use C weighted. And so then what you do is you want to hit just one speaker. So I'll start with the left speaker. And then when, what you do is you roll your overall volume monitors up. And on mine, it clicks. I got stepped. So I click it as close as possible. Then I go to the gain on the back of the speaker. And I'll adjust it until I've got 87 and a half decibels. But mine are a little far away from me. So I go, some people want 85. That's too quiet for some people. Some people like to bump it. 90 should be the loudest you ever go. And so what I like to do is 87 and a half, because then if I want to crank a couple notches, then I'm hitting 90 and it's more fun. So uh, you get the left speaker at 87 and a half dB SPL. Then what you're going to do is leave everything exactly as it is, kill that speaker and go to the right speaker. Then you want to use that and you want to leave the volume knob where it is, 
go directly to the gain on the back of the speaker and adjust that up until that's also 87 and a half dB because now you've calibrated left and right speakers until they're the exact same output. And now you've got a position on your volume, master volume, that you know is that volume. Now, they're going to sum together and they're going to be louder than 80, 80. So that's probably 90. Now turn that speaker back on, back the knob off until the stereo signal is reading 85. Then take a little piece of console tape and create a hash mark and so every time you start mixing from now on, you turn the volume to that spot. And this is your mix volume. But there's another step. The problem is, is that if you do this for your mix volume, when you play a mastered record, it's going to be 8 to 10 decibels right, louder right, right, than way this. Louder, right. So the next step is now pull up a mastered record that you trust. And you know it sounds great. No algorithms. Just get the raw high def file of a, whatever record that you love in the genre that you mix the most. That sounds amazing. Put that up and read the SPL. You're going to end up turning your volume down eight or nine decibels until you get that 87 and a half dB or 85 dB and make a second hash mark and label it mastered. So one hash is mix, one hash is maxer. So when every time you start a mix, turn the volume knob to mix, then faders down and bring them up. And so, then, your, so your first hashtag is like hashtag M and your second one is hashtag M. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Mass and mix. But I, I know where it is. And actually what I do now is on mine, I've got a dim. So it's negative 20 decibels. So right. when I'm checking masters, I just hit the dim button. Yeah. So I don't have to do that. But this is what you want to do. So now you've calibrated your rig. So now what I do is I bring, based on how I like to hear music, I check reference tracks. Here's the general volume of drums across all the competitive reference tracks I've done. We talked about competition earlier. Then I do mine until they go into my drum compressor, and then I adjust the threshold until it's tickling. And a little bit of gain out, because I like the output gain of the API. I want to work the op amp. So maybe you only put it in a little bit, and you work the op amp a little bit, and then you bring the threshold down until you've got a sound. Now... The output of that of that analog um, compression on your drum bus is competitive to all these mastered mixes. You're like, yeah, the, we brought them down in volume, but now it's balanced the same. Then you know that all you got to do is push your drums into that zone, and then all of your songs have drums in the same zone. The compressor is your eyes in that sense. It's telling you how loud to put your drums, and that speeds your workflow. Now yeah, I'm going to totally. take that same concept. This is the same with brow rising. And I'm going to apply that same concept to my three music buses. So if I've got a compressor, a stereo, dual mono stereo compressor, like two LA three A's, I'm going to calibrate those left and right with some test tones. And I'm going to get them so they sit where ACDC back and black guitars sit on the record. If I reference it, if I uh, level match reference it, the ACDC guitars are like right here and it's the greatest sound in the world. And I'm like, yeah. So I'm going to put the test tones and I'm going to move my thing so that the LA three A's are tapping when I get him into that zone. So I look and I get the tone of the LA three A's or whatever it is. And I push my guitars up. Oh, now the LA three A's are tapping, right? Boom. So now I can go drums, guitars, and I just look at the meters and then whatever else it is. Maybe you have one for synths. Maybe you got a 33609 compressor. And then you're like, Oh, I love that for my synth pads or whatever. Cause it's gushy. And like you do the same thing until all of your compressors are set in a way that guides you through the general balancing of a mix that's competitive. Now you have your sound for the balances you like on your records that are both globally competitive and reflect your taste in music because people hire you for your taste and the fact that you can give them a product that's globally competitive. It's always those two things. What separates you from the next mixer is how you blend music, how you hear things, the effects you choose, the way you like things to sound. I like bright records. I'm getting older. I was a DJ. I played in rock bands. I played drums. My hearing is a little going to be, you know, over time, I'm going to lose some high end. So I like things bright. And so I works a, well for Nashville country too. It does too. And I rely on the relationship with my mastering engineer and he knows how I like to mix my records. And so he knows I like things bright. So when I'm using Pete, Pete has these really killer high frequency limiters that he's got because he's doing a lot of vinyl cutting. So he uses those on my records to bring the highs down and it gets this perfect blend of bright, but not too bright. But that's the beautiful relationship of having a mastering engineer, because I think it sounds great in my room. It goes to Pete. He says it's a little too bright, but I know Dan likes bright. So boom, that's a good relationship, right? And that's yeah. the other side of building that over years is that you want to have somebody who knows your work and knows what to expect. Yeah, great tip, great yeah. tip. So 
Now you've set up, essentially set up your bus compression thing. What didn't I compress? I didn't compress the bass and I didn't compress the lead vocal or lead guitar. Why? Because I don't want the loudest things in my mix. Bass always has the most low end energy and vocals always going to have the most middle energy. And when I say middle, I mean like phantom middle, phantom center. It has the most center energy. It's like, and both of these live in the phantom center. So they're both coming out of both speakers all the time because there is no phantom center. There is only left and right. And how much signal is coming out of left or right? There is no panning of anything. It doesn't exist. It's not actually there. It's just playing louder out of one side than the other. And our brain interpolates this. Yeah, totally. So we have to always pay attention to the speaker cone. Look at your speaker cone. You know what my favorite place in a mix is, is when I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I feel the wind from the speaker cone hit me in the face and I know that it's in phase and it's bumping because if the speakers were not in phase, I wouldn't get even wind out of each one. But when that bass kicks and it goes boom and the wind puffs you in the face and it feels like- a ported speaker? Yeah, I have these two little uh, Chris Polonis Model 42s that I use as my workhorses. Um, so I have Chris Polonis Model 42 Mark II. They're currently out of print, but you can still get them all over the place. They use Tannoy Gold 4-inch coaxial mounted tweeters. They're awesome. And they're incredibly phase accurate because they don't use DSP to do time alignment. It's it's a patented physical mounting of the tweeter inside the woofer. So the tweeter and the woofer are perfectly firing in phase. So the time alignment is, is perfection. However, there's a roll off above 13K. And there's nothing below 70 hertz. So I had to pair them with a subwoofer. And then I don't check my high highs on them. Anytime I want to know about sibilance or air or whatever, I check headphones or same thing with subs. I'll check. I have a really good pair of um, UltraZone Signature Pros that I use. They're like $600 headphones. Um, They show me exactly what's happening on the ultra highs. And they show me exactly what's happening in the ultra lows because it avoids any room acoustics because I'm on headphones. I don't balance anything on those. I put them on. I turn the volume up until it sounds good to what I'm hearing. And I just listen to the S's and I listen to the, how much, and I go in and I'll, you know, make some cuts in the cymbals and I'll make some cuts in the guitars and I'll smooth out the top end there. And then I'll switch up. I have a PMC 228s. I love them. They're the largest of the two speaker line. They're retail, I believe at 8,000. The next level up from that is the IBS ones, which start at 10,000 to 12, though it's a three-way speaker. Uh, and then the stuff that you guys probably know from like mastering engineers, they're like $50,000, like they're like subs and stacks. Like Pete's got the like $50,000 PMC. Yeah, I've seen those. They're monsters Amazing in there. Amazing sounding. But okay, so the 228s are the biggest of the like affordable line two-way speakers. I've always liked two-way speakers because cheap three-way speakers have two crossover points which means that you're going to have a speaker if it's not properly time-aligned, there's no DSP, and they didn't design it perfectly well, you're going to have some weird... uh, Yeah, more room for error. More room for error. So I like, and I think younger mixers in smaller rooms, two-way speakers are great. So I got these uh, 228s. Eventually, I'll upgrade them when I'm rich and famous. All right, let me keep moving forward here. So um, we've got this sort of browserized system where you're routing things. You've got your, your drums or leaving Pro Tools and they're going to outboard compressors, and then they're going to your summing thing. Okay, and um, the summing has a built-in 1176 in parallel. Okay, that I can great. assign either to the master or a subgroup. So uh, I have it set to the drums because I used to use it on um, everything. And then what I realized is, is that anything with a really long sustain and a- Mono 1176 or, or a pair of them? Uh, I, I don't know exactly. I, it, they just give you an on-off switch. Oh, it's, and in, a, it's, it's built in. It's built in. Like, which, what, which summing mixer do you use? It's Dangerous 2Bus Plus. Gotcha. And right. it's got right. three things built in on parallel knobs. The first one is they call Paralimiter. It's effectively an 1178, but they've built it from scratch and it's set to death kill. So it's like on like all buttons in, but like they custom designed it. So it's definitely a FET limiter, but set to like mega ultra mega death. And then it's on a parallel throw. So you get a knob and the knob is effectively a fader. It's not wet dry. It's zero to unity. So you, I just found a spot that I really works for me and I try and leave it alone as much as possible, but I'll change it a little bit because sometimes you get a little too forward pushy and it sounds a little like. Right. Little, too spitty, too attacky. Yeah. And so then I'll back it off. But but you're talking about one knob that I tweak a little bit based on my ear. And then 
And that's this is the knob that sends it to that parallel compressor. No, it's, that's in there. it sends a full unity, and it, the knob is the return, how oh, much gotcha. return you get. So it starts at zero, which is off. And as you go all the way to the full throw, that would be unity with your original. So I usually run it at about uh, a third, right? And it sounds awesome. And it lifts the room ambiance, and it gives you all the cave that you're looking for. And it also gives you a bunch of transient punch. Sounds great. But it doesn't sound great on pianos, organs, synth pads. It distorts because it doesn't have – it's built for – Anything oh, it's that, too much sustaining long note energy, right? Isn't it? So it's just it, it's, it's like it's, if you've ever tried to do hard, hard limiting compression and and like quick attack and stuff on a bass, you get that distort distortion on the compressor. yeah, and it's that fizzy distortion, not the one you want. Yeah, it's yeah. so it's it's I I just I used to use it on the whole thing, and then I was like, man, something's distorting, and then I realized when I took all the sustaining instruments out. It did exactly what I wanted because why does it work for the ambiance? Because all that ambiance is beneath the threshold, right? So it's not getting any of the effect. Right, totally. So that's why it works beautifully on drum rooms and stuff because it, it limits all the transients. And then since it's slightly late, a little bit of the transient gets through and then all of the ambiance. And so you bring all that up to the place where you're like, bang, I tell you what, my sample libraries sound awesome when I do that because nobody gets it to sound like me. And it's just built into my gear. That's cool, man. All right, so let, now let's rewind, or no, let's keep moving, keep, keep forward, moving forward, and then we'll rewind. Yeah, yeah. But but after the summing mixer, what's the next thing? Do you, okay, do you so, go through some through some stereo processing? Yes. So on the summing mixer, I have an insert on the master of it. So that insert goes out to a dangerous liaison. The liaison's great because it has the ability to basically be. It's like a patch bay. It's a relayed patch bay essentially. So you have buttons and you can insert a bunch of different stuff. So the idea is that you've got on the B line. So there's two circuits, A and a B. So there's a, there's a trick that people use and they route a into B, which is cool. So on the back of it, so like the insert goes into a, I take the output of a line and I go into B and then I take the output of B and that's the return on the loop as the insert point on my two bus plus. And so what that gives me access to is I can put anything in front of anything else because it's top to bottom. And if you look at the unit, that would kind of make sense. So I'm telling you, almost everybody uses it this way. If they don't use it this way, it's because they are using the top line for an individual bus. But everybody's a creature of habit, especially with analog gear because you're trying to avoid recalls. So most people will set it up the easiest way that allows you to do any combination. So on the B side, if you look at it, there's this little orange line that drops down and two, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, two, four, no, I think it's two, four, and six. It's either one, three, and five or two, four, and six. I think it's two, four, and six. Two, four, and six have the option of becoming parallel. And again, Dangerous understands that it's not about wet, dry knobs. In my opinion, wet, dry knobs are only good for reverb and time-based effects. Yeah, I always struggled with wet dry knobs for parallel compression. I don't effects. like it. I think it's it, it goes it's counterintuitive. I want my clean signal exactly where I left it, and then I want to bring up the parallel enhance, compression. Yeah. So, for example, um, Boz Digital Labs they make the uh, Manic Man. compressor, yep. and it's brilliant the way Boz put that together, where you've got the fader for your clean signal coming through, and then just a second fader. You yep. press it, sneak it in but to where you want it. You know? That's New York style compression. That's how they invented it. Is that's that's what all them. That's why they have the ninety six channel SSLs. Is that they're molting at the top using the number buttons. It molts it. They compress the snot out of it, and then they they fade it in on its own fader. Your original audio stays exactly where you left it. You bring in stuff that makes it bigger and better. No wet dry knob allows you to get to one hundred and twenty five percent, but on console style you can get as much as you want. You could effectively get up to 200% or you could go above Unity and have an unbalanced even more. Okay, so what processing are you doing on these inserts? What do you okay. what, what do you put there? So on my insert, it goes to the liaison. On the liaison, I have mastering equalizer. I have a Bax EQ. Bax EQ is Bax and Doll Curve EQ. The Bax and Doll is most commonly found in car stereos where you just have high and low. So what is it? It's a big smiley face curve. So what it does is it extends the highs and extends the subs. So this is really great for a mix because what I do is that's in serial strapped across my master bus. Every mix is just going through that on flat. Then what I do is on mine, I found that if I just boost it to plus three on the highs and the lows, and I have some filters in there as well, which is cool. Check out the unit, back CQ. There's even a, a UAD version of it. And 
if I boost highs and subs on the master bus in this really gentle way, I use less EQ on the fader level. And so what's great is, is that I'm doing less work on the plug-in fader level because I have this EQ on my master bus sweetening for me. And so that's just workflow. Like I don't recommend everybody puts an EQ on their master bus and jacks it up and says, no, Dr. Ford told me to just jack it up and go. What happened is, is that I just found that it worked with my working style. So for you guys, until you uh, guys and gals, until you, until you get used to something like that, leave it at zero, finish your mix and then futz with it, mess with it, add a little sweetening. When you find that the average of all the mixes you did in six months all tend to have the same boost, then just leave it there. Right. And then just start mixing into it for the next time. See Call it a goes. day. But then what ends up happening is you get fader creep. And then what happens is that you start relying on that. And then as you're finished, you end up jacking it up a little farther anyways, because your taste is what your taste is. You know, what it makes me think of too, is um, when you learn analog tape, for example, um, you learn about pre-emphasis and post-emphasis. Yep. So, you know, there's pre-emphasis in the record side and well, and I think there may be post emphasis on the Depends playback on how side you tweak too. It, tweak the, but the also, head. like that was at the core of things like um, Dolby noise reduction and things like that. It's like you compress something a whole lot to make it sit on the tape, and then you expand it a little more and brighten it up again on the return. And when you think about mixing and all the things that can, the complexity and the routing that can go in, and the stuff we're trying to do, it, it makes some sense. It's almost like we're trying to glue everything together and smash it together and you, and there's not, and you don't want to, you may not have room to boost a bunch of lows or boost a bunch of highs, or it sounds funny, but then you come to the end and you kind of let, let the lows and the highs yeah. breathe again with some EQ can really help. And for me, I spend enough time with mastering engineers that I'm always looking at what they're fixing. What is a master? What could the first time? So like when you trust a mastering engineer, you don't need to attend your sessions and you shouldn't like, it's like watching someone undress that, you know what I mean? Like you, you really shouldn't like, it's like, you don't want to see behind the curtain. Right. Totally. Right? I just like to sit back and, and like, yeah. listen, just trust them. Like m at nine times out of 10, I allow a great mastering engineer. Uh, Pete's got like seven Grammys or I'll use like a uh, Randy at Sterling who's mixed everybody from Adele to Lady Gaga. Now, like, the other thing is um, a lot of times you're sitting back there and you're like, Ooh, that what's that weird thing with the kick. And like, you start noticing them. A lot, usually it's because they're also noticing it and they're trying to accentuate it so that they can figure out how to control it. Yeah. You know? it's, so nobody just, wants just sit you, yeah, quietly. You don't want someone to watch you mixing when you're like soloing stuff and you're hunting and pecking for EQ spikes, you know, and the client would be like, what are you doing? You're like, just wait, it'll make sense in eight hours. Right. So, so you don't really want to be in your, and, and usually get a better rate when you're not attended sessions. However, it's really important when you're working with a new mastering engineer that you absolutely do go in there and visit them because what you want to do is you want your your um you want your your mix up on their speakers and you want to hear what it sounds like because there was a mastering engineer in Los Angeles, not my friend Mike Well, who's also a great mastering engineer. Mike Wells, MikeWellsMastering.com. Not him. He's awesome. But this other guy, great guy, bunch of awards. I went into his mastering studio studio and I was auditioning to him to make me work on some records. And I, he, I put up a mix I was really proud of that somebody else, actually Mike Wells had already mastered and it sounded great. And so I was, I put it up just the mix, not the master. And my mix sounded awful in his room. And he made a bunch of critiques on it. And I was like, we don't have the same taste in music. Right. Totally. We don't like right. music to sound the same way. It was a bad pairing. Great guy. Great. He's got a lot of awards. He's doing great things, but it was never going to work for me. So it's okay. We can still be friends. <laughs> All right. So dig it. So let's go from the, the back CQ. What's the next thing in your uh, channel? Okay. Well, before the back CQ, I have a parallel compression setup. So again, not a wet dry knob. The liaison has those three orange lines. Mm -hmm. If you have, if you click the button, it either is a serial compressor or it drops into parallel. When it drops into parallel, it goes into the orange line, and then the orange line goes over to the knob on the right of the liaison. And again, just like I explained the right, parallelimeter. You're just, you're just doing a parallel compression, but what compressor do you like to use? Uh, I'm currently using the Dangerous Compressor because- Oh, so I, it's built into that no, guy No, 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 it's a separate rack. It's called Dangerous Compressor. So um, I love the Dangerous Compressor. In a perfect world, I think I would like to take the dangerous compressor and use it in serial because it has a lot of really great mastering compressor functions built in without getting into a product tutorial. It's got some very specific issues that it deals with. Like it basically has a dual detection circuit. 
And I actually have a video series coming out where I talk about all this with Dangerous that came to my studio and filmed it as a product thing. And right on. It's, it's coming out. I know we filmed it. It's in editing. But there's two detection curves. And so the Dangerous compressor looks, and if it senses a giant 808, a big old subby bass, or a really, really, really heavy kick transient, it switches detection circuits on the fly, and it shifts to one that's got a much softer knee, and it's much more gradual, so that the compressor never pumps when a big kick hits it. Plus the bass cut and it's super transparent and it does this beautiful thing where it like hugs your mix and then you get all this fluff out of it without it sounding compressed because I hate it when a mastering engineer makes my record sound more compressed. I already went through all that. I want right. I want you to make me sound competitive. I don't want you to alter it, right? right? right. And so um, it's great for that. So in a perfect world, I would take that out of the parallel. I'd put that in serial on my master bus and I wouldn't mix through that. I would set it, or maybe I would. Maybe I would do the same thing that I've talked about here with test tones and averages, and I would have it just sort of gently taking away one to two or three decibels, and maybe I'd get a mid-side matrix, or maybe I'd do something. I don't know. We'll talk about that later. So now now you've got the uh, dangerous compressor, which is feeding the back CQ on your stereo mix. Do you also go through just a stereo compressor that, that ca- catches everything? Or? Not yet, and that's okay. what I'm saying. Right, I would, it. in a perfect world, switch out the dangerous compressor from parallel compression duties to get loudness to the stereo compression duties, and I'd probably, probably get a second API 2500, and I would use that for parallel compression because that API 2500 is a beast. And that thrust circuit plus the, the dual link thing I talked about, you can basically tell it, a ratio, there's a clickable knob. So it says like, go from dual mono to straight stereo or a ratio in between, which is super unique. And I haven't seen it on anything else. Paul Wolf designed it. He's great. That compressor is, a, I, I'd love a second 2500, but in maybe I would take the 2500 off my drum bus, switch that to parallel, get an SSL. Maybe the SSL goes on my, I don't know. There's so many configurations, but that's, what's brilliant about everybody getting their own sound is that you set up these analog templates and that's part of your sound. Your sound isn't, it's like, that's what makes you different. And because you get all that sound fast. And so that's the key to a hybrid workflow is that you want to mix to the fader and then have it automatically. You pick the outputs, they go to the compressors and the EQs. It gets you right in the ballpark of where you want to be so that all of your sessions you pull up sound like your balances and your mix and your amount of bass and all that. So now uh, we may have a lot of listeners at this point um, who are, their heads are spinning a little bit. They're like $50,000 speakers, $10,000 this. So now um, a lot of these things, um, I think we could potentially find some sort of equivalent in the box if we're if that's where yeah. we're working, right? Almost all of them exist as UAD, Plugin Alliance, Acoustica. I love Acoustica. Yeah, those guys are great. Um, they're all there. So the what I the reason why people like us at this stage, and I'm in the middle. So yes, I've done a bunch of stuff. Yes, I'm piling up my accolades because I'm selling myself to my clients. I want to beat the other people. I'm I am the competition. If you don't see me as competition, then we haven't gone up against each other. But I'm gonna use everything I have to get that client. And so that's the reason why I I market my awards and I market all my number ones and like whatever. They're not as great as a Ken Lewis. Ken Lewis comes in with a 99 platinum records and it's like, okay, well, he wins. If he meets my price point, I can't compete with Ken. Well, let's let's dial it back but, and, and well, go back to yeah. the base too. Well, well, we, was, we got lots more to come. Yes, but that question is, do these things exist? Why do we buy them in analog? So I don't have to load up plugins. I want them to stay the same place I left them, right. song to song. Dig it, but I asked the I asked the plugin question because uh, you know making sure we're we're given to our listeners here. It's they they don't have the analog stuff. Yet, no, you know? and but that's sort of the point is that that that's the the tie in is that there's no there's no reason for you to break the bank over a ten thousand dollar compressor like the Alicia Master Comp when until you can, you've got a ten thousand dollar client. Well. Or until you've spent $200 on the Plugin Alliance version and you've gotten used to it and you know it's something you want and then you can justify it. Right, right? totally. Like why would you ever not demo the crap out of something in a low cost situation? Like Waves has the CLA 1176. Those are great. Before you ever bought an 1176 from UA for $2,000, why wouldn't you spend 150 bucks on the CLA 1176 and get used to it?
Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own records, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. And the best part is these techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you're using right now. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. So let me ask you some questions about... Um, Quick ones about drum shells, and then let's go straight to bass and okay. talk about the okay. low end on this stuff. Um, kick, snare, toms, and overhead EQs. What are some basic EQ settings that you find that uh, beginners and people sort of in the early stages of their mix journey could find very useful places to look? Okay, so for me, snare is all about parallel. And so a lot of people, I've come to a place now where, okay, so I, I get a raw snare drum. And what I'll do is listen to it and I'll say, okay, what, what do I want to change? Probably about recorded it? with an SM57 on top. Sure. Okay. So let's talk about mics then real quick, because this is really important. Tracking engineers do very specific things because they were taught to do very specific things in this fallback stuff. So an SM57 is not a really wide frequency band. It's really kind of pointed in the mid range and it's great, but it, it is what it is. And once you get used to that sound, you know what it is. So what people do is they get an SM57 and they point it at 45 degrees and they put it on the ring of the snare right above the rim. And why wouldn't they? Because the drum uh, stick is swinging around. So it's not like you can put it in the optimal sweet spot. What's the sweet spot for a snare drum? N dead center of the snare drum and like a foot off the snare drum so that you can get the center where the snares are. But you can't do that because then your drummer would hit your microphone and it would just never work. So they put it at 45 degrees off the ring. Well, anybody who's ever hit a snare drum knows that what happens when you click the ring of a snare drum with a stick, what do you get? A side stick. Yeah. Boom. Right. Not side stick that like, the, if you like, oh, just the sound of the yeah, drum like if shell you if you start in the middle, it's like bah, 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 boom, 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 and you hit that ring. Right, totally. So basically, you're putting a microphone on the ring of the snare drum. That seems super smart, but that's all we get. So okay, so this is where reengineering comes in. So basically, what you're saying is your ego is going to tell you, no, you have to use that. Okay, well, if you're the one out of thirty people that actually killed that recording, and it's like, wow, this sounds great, I'm going to use it. Otherwise, I'm going to re-trigger something because I don't care because the client never knows. What if I have, if I could, if I can tell what snare drum you used, oh, dude, they had a Black Beauty right there. Oh, you know what? The Blackbird kit from Slate Digital has a Black Beauty snare in it. I'm just going to grab the four microphones they set up in a closed environment where the drummer was perfectly hitting it and didn't click the sticks and they were in the optimal mic position. I'm going to do that and I'm going to spend the 20 minutes automating the detail on it so that every single ghost note is accounted for so I can get the perfect thing. So my philosophy for snare drum is I like to work in parallel. I like to make copies of it and do specific things. I need this to be brighter. Then I'm going to duplicate it, compress the snot out of it, maybe peak limit it heavily, like I talked about with 1176 on death stun. And then I'm going to maybe put a clarifonic on it and I'm going to boost the highs out of control. And then I'm going to take that in parallel and I'm going to sneak it in. So Clarifonic's an EQ plugin? Yeah, I love that. That's the Kush Clarifonic. I love that. Oh, thing. Yeah, yeah. I keep hearing about Kush on the podcast and I He's great. still need to go check Super. it out because I know that they're great stuff. I use the Clarifonic on every mix and I intend to buy both a mono 500 unit for my vocals and I intend to buy a stereo for my master bus. It is awesome. I Literally, I use a Clarifonic on every vocal, uh, oftentimes on a snare drum. It's fantastic. So what what frequencies are kind of useful to know about if you're going to boost or cut anything on a snare? Well, what's nice about the Baxendahl EQ is that it's a really, really gentle, smiley-faced EQ that lifts from the top and slides into, uh, what you call it, a, a, a concave curve. So what we like, so another thing I like about the Kush Clarifonic is that you go to the high bands and you boost them and it's this really gentle thing. So what's happening when you're starting from the top and you're working towards the lows is that you boost the air first 
what is a snare? It's all metal and rattle. So I'm going to reach for the under snare and I'm going to try and brighten that up. And I'm going to work on this because it's so funny. It's like the top head. When you turn this, take the snares off of a snare drum, what does the top head sound like? A timbali, boom, boom. Yeah, right? Totally. Where's all the meat of a snare drum? It's the under snare. Everybody mixes that down. I like the under snare. Give me the crack. What are you looking for? What does the song need? What's the mood? Is it dark and moody? I'm not going to go crazy. I'm going to give it a lot of meat. So the two areas you want to really focus on on a snare drum is the meaty cut through, which generally lives just above the kick drum, right around like 150 to 400, depending on how the snare's tuned. You're going to get that ooh sound, that boom, right? Out of a great snare drum, that like thing that moves the speakers kind of and hits cuts. you in the chest. Yeah. So, so look at that range that again, maybe you should hit it in parallel and like compress it and then boost up that range because then what you can do is you can bring the attack lazier. It lets more transient through and then you boost that transient to be more bassy and you blend it in in parallel because what happens is, is that when you work in parallel, I love working in parallel. When you work in parallel, you maintain the integrity of the authentic original recording instead right. of adding a bunch of phase to it because EQs are phase. That's how they work on a fundamental level. So if I can keep them in line with the original recording and, and 14 mics on a drum kit, it's all about phase, time alignment. Yep. So maintaining phase integrity is is absolutely key. So focus on the punch, focus on the crack, the rattle, the air, top and bottom on a snare drum. You do those two things and then it's just cutting resonant frequencies you don't like. Boom. This is a really notch frequency. Just cut yep. it out. Boom. The ring's Very gone. Cue. You're good to go. But remember, if it's ringing boom, on the direct it's ringing on the overheads and it's ringing on the room mics. So sometimes it's best when you get a snare EQ, then kill all the tonal enhancements, but keep the notch filtering and just copy that over to your overheads and copy that to your room mics mm. and see if you can get that to work. Although sometimes like a funk tune, they want a little bit of ring. Right, totally. So that's- Again, artistic yeah, call. Artistic so, call. So let's jump back to a kick drum. What are some frequencies that you would reach for on a kick drum to try and give it more power, make sure the beater's cutting through, okay, and, and maybe lose a little bit of the basketball? Gen uh, genre specific, um, you know, metal and heavy stuff likes less subs, more click because it's going so fast, 30 yep. second notes, yeah. that they need the diction more than they need the sub. So let's assume we're doing a generic genre that's some hybrid that lives between yeah, pop and hip hop and like general rock. Yeah. So we want a good extension on our kick drum. What am I going to do first? I'm going to gate the kick drum because what happens is, is that sine waves are long. And when you look at them and this, I do this in, 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 uh, urban mixing as well. So anytime I'm getting like, like a, like a lot of people just grab a sample and they throw it up. But a good mixer is paying attention to the interaction of the frequencies between multiple things. And so this actually leads into bass. So I want you to just sort of infer that as I talk about it, and we'll get to bass in a second. So you hit a kick and the sub goes, boo. it has length to it. The sine wave is long. At 80 hertz, the sine wave off a kick drum, if it's centered at 80 hertz, is 16 feet. If you get that in the mix, you'll see it's long. It's like an 808. Boom. It's not short. What do we want? We want tight, punchy, depending on the record, tight, punchy. So like if I'm like, okay, this first thing is how long is the subs on my kick drum? I'm going to gate it. Slate Trigger 2 has my favorite gate. I They made the Slate gate for the virtual mix rack. I still prefer it in the Trigger 2 because I like more detailed stuff. I throw yeah. the mix knob to zero. So it just lets you hear your original record. And always, always, always use dual mono linked trigger two when doing the gate trick because a stereo trigger two listens to the left side and the right side is your uh, bleed control. So if you put a stereo trigger two on a stereo kick drum, you will get a summed mono of the left side and lose all your stereo information. Hmm. So if you have a stereo kick drum, use dual mono trigger two, turn the mix all the way to zero. Now you hear what you had, turn the gate on and you get to use the gate and you look at the trigger because the trigger for triggering samples opens the gate now and it's brilliant. So first thing I do is I'll tighten up the sub response from like, if you have like sub mic or whatever the low, maybe it's the, the wood of the thing. Are you getting a boom? Yeah. Maybe boom. they've got a front head on it. It's yeah. sustaining a long time. And because the, the, the click 
of the beater mic usually takes care of itself. EQ that tonally to taste. You know, it is what it is. But we got to deal with the sub mic, the, the, the foot of the kick drum. So then I'm going to gate it, deal with sustain. Well, I love the, the, slate, the slate gate because it's ADSR just like a synth. So you attack delay, uh, attack decay, sustain, and release. Or attack sustain. No, it's ADSR. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. So you get to dial all of those in. How long does the gate stay open? Then how long does it go down? And then the tail of it, you know what I mean? Like it's so great. So you dial it in. And what I do is I turn the release tail all the way to zero. So it's clipping. And then I'll back it up until I get one good clean cycle of the sub. And I'm like, yep, that's the length I want. And you it, don't just ignore the click for now. Get it. And you're like, boop, boop, boop. And you're like, okay, yeah, that's the length I want. It's punchy. It's working. I lost some subs because I removed the cycles. So the low 40 hertz, 50 hertz is not getting to complete a cycle. So we lost the subs. Then you play with the release to get rid of that click and you open it up a little bit so it's a natural sounding decay. And now you've got a punchier kick drum, but you lost some subs. Then here's what I do. I duplicate that fader, then mute the original. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the sustain and the release and I'm gonna take them all the way to like, zero until I get what I call a blip blip, blip, blip. and then you open it a little bit blip, blip, until some of the subs come through, blip, blip, blip. but it's super tight. Then you do a little bit of the release so that the clip goes away. No more digital clipping distortion blip, blip, like that. Then I put an EQ on that and I just jack the subs all the way crazy. Right. So you're getting as much low end transient at the beginning, but it's also very quick, just right. And then I blend that in parallel. So I'm listening to my one that's moderately gated, but lost some subs. And then I pull the other one up, the blip in parallel. And it's like, it's like God put his foot into your record. I'm telling you, it's like, it's like the trick that was passed to me from Jack Joseph Puig. He did it with editing. He would literally edit those to the cycle he showed us a mix with the masters he wow. looked at the waveform so it's one complete waveform slice crossfade and his assistant would go through and prep that for him and then he put an eq on he did it all manually i figured out slate trigger two does it for you so you don't have to deal with all that and it, it's it's just like it's a banging trick so that's cool definitely man. Great, try that great trick right there same thing for snare drum literally same trick there was a lot of times where i would do that in my template and I just have it built in. And so a fader pops up into my template with the triggers and my favorite setting, save it as a preset. And then, cause you like, once you get the blip dialed in, it's going to work on every record. Right. Wow. That's cool, man. Great, great tip. Um, All right. So we're run out of time here, but oh no. um, let me okay, see bass. if you can give us anything quick about bass. Bass is super sign -off. important. Okay. So uh, bass is arguably one of the most important things mixing in a record because it has the most complexities. So if you're recording a bass guitar, the diameter of the string versus the length of the, the math here, the length of the string from the nut to the plectrum, the um, note you're playing crosses on a graph. That's a, it's a tri, what is that? X, Y, Z graph, length, diameter, and note. So what happens on a bass guitar, same thing with synthesizers. I don't know why, but it does. You get those pokey outy notes because why what's happening is that you have resonances that are happening in the math between the note you're playing, the diameter, and the length. Harmonics, boom, 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 boom. It's the same thing, right? It, this is literally what we're doing. And so what's happening as you play certain notes on the bass guitar, harmonics come and what I call bloom. So you have like, it just one happens. Our, one of our least favorite things about trying to record yeah. and mix bass, right? Okay, so maybe the best option would be for you to clip gain. So that's probably the best thing to start with is that you go to those notes and you clip gain them until they sound pretty solid. But the problem is, is that the tonality has changed. So yes, you can adjust the overall volume with clip gain, but then you're going to have like, do, 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 And you're going to be like, oh, that doesn't sound right anymore. Yeah, it's the same volume, but it's just not right. You could probably ignore those. But okay, so what happens is, is that I like dynamic equalization. What is a dynamic EQ? It's a single band of a multiband without being locked to anything else. It's a, a dynamic EQ is someone setting up a notch on an equalizer and automating the gain up and down. It's a gain automating robot. Okay. So it has a threshold and then it says, Oh, you hit the threshold. I'm going to gain down on this notch. That's what I love about dynamic EQs. They're my favorite thing. I always start with dynamic EQs before I use regular EQs. Why? Because the rule with EQing, this is one of Dr. Ford's rules. 
The rule is, is it a problem that is consistent for the entire song? If yes, notch it with a static equalization. My snare drum has a ring every time it gets hit. Great. EQ it once, it solves the problem for the entire track. But in bass, these problems only exist per note. Is this a problem that happens throughout the entire song? No, it only happens on specific notes. Then use dynamic equalization because you can set the threshold so that when the problem happens, the effect is that we do this thing, right? So what you're going to do is essentially pick the fundamental of the note that's doing it. You just solo band past the thing, sweep it until it's like, boom. oh, there it is. Great. And then back off the threshold loop the section, and then just start lowering the threshold until none of the other notes activate it. And you're probably going to get a little dip that doesn't really work very well, but at least the compressor is paying attention correctly. Now you have two options here. You can either just duplicate that compressor 12 times. So each one is taking off the same little bit and nobody else is affected or like the one I use as my first grab is the Brainworks Dynamic EQ version two. It has a um, basically ratio, but they call it factor. And so it you can pull the factor up and it just applies more when the threshold is hit, right? So you, what you do is you keep the factor low, get it so it's just tickling the note so that none of the other notes are touching it. And then you jack up the factor until it removes the amount of that resonation that you didn't want. Bob's your uncle. Now, the other cool thing you can do is you could probably do one of these on each note the bass is playing and you could adjust them and then your dynamic EQs are going to go in and they're going to regulate all the notes to generally be the same tonality in the same dynamic range. Then when you compress it with like say an LA-2A, you're going to get all the tube tone from the bottom and the richness in LA-2A and it's going to ride the general volumes and your, your bass is mixed. So most people don't understand they have to EQ bass to the note with dynamic equalizers. Figure yeah. that out and you're good to go. The last thing I'll say, and I know we're out of time, is that the trick to EQing toms is two things. Number one, basketball lives somewhere around eight to 900 hertz. So a lot of people, Chris Lordalgy, Tom Lordalgy, a lot of these people will really focus on that range to get all the like really stuff you don't want. And the second thing that I always do on toms is I use a high pass filter. You have to be careful because high pass filters rotate phase. So remember we talked about drums are all about phase. So you may want something like the UAD IBP in between phase and you may want to rotate them back or you may want to follow it with a secondary high pass filter also using a high pass filter, even though you don't need it. So you can rotate the phase back case by case. Make sure you're listening. Some to mono, listen to the phase. It may not make a big difference. Sometimes it does. High pass filters rotate phase. Then you want to spike the resonance on your high pass oh, filter. Let me clarify that. So you're saying that even though we set the the um, polarity of our tom mic properly when we were recording the drums, just the fact that we're adding a high pass filter on it at the mix stage has already shifted that phase a little bit in relationship degrees. against the high the highs and stuff or yeah, the, the overheads rather. No, to itself. Not and so now you what you had as completely in phase from 20k down to 90 hertz. Then from 90 hertz down, it's out of phase. I'm serious about that. Go look it up. Mm. That's that's readily information you can get on Google. It's high passes rotate phase, roughly 90 so degrees. So the IBP would help realign that phase potentially sure, you on could that just, low part, which is the part that's so critical. Yeah, in, 270 in degrees, you'd be back to where you started. Or three more high pass filters or something. Play with it. You may not need it. You may not hear it. It's okay. But be aware of it. Then what you do is high pass on your toms, and then what you want to do is watch the fundamental frequency. What I like to do is put a resonant peak on the high pass, and then I move that resonant peak to the fundamental frequency of a tom. Now, the trick is when you hit a tom, the fundamental will drop 30, 40, 50. You listen to it, it goes boom, boom. Right. 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 You watch it on a really good EQ, you'll see it. So you want to kind of have a broad curve so that it gets that whole button right there. And then hit the resonance. And then what you're going to do is you're going to ride that resonance up until you get that tom sound you like or down and remove it if you want the trashy tom sound, like a punk record or an indie rock record. And you're not looking for that big like doo-doo, doo-doo, doo-doo. Like you right. want that, spike it up. If you want like the, re- you know what I'm talking about, that like really empty thrashy sound, then get rid of the fundamental, right? And so there's two different ways you can go. That always works. I'm telling you, and it cleans out the stuff below. So, you know, what's below kick drum, 
and room resonances that you probably don't want because you spend all this time working on that. So toms are great. Overheads, limit the snare drum, work on that, match EQs, um, think about air, think about cymbals, all that stuff. And then room mics, you know, room mics are very artistic. So you can have a lot of fun with room it's mics. More expressive. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's it's the it's the vibe of your record. Like, do I want it mono? Sometimes I just want room mics mono because I want to add sustain to my kick and snare. Sometimes I want them really wide so it sounds like you're immersed in it. Sometimes it needs to live at 50-50. And the last thing I'll say about mixing drums, and we didn't get into this, but panning is really cool when you stereo inverse link something. So when you pull up the big fader on Pro Tools, there's three buttons. So like you, not the standard mix fader, but you click that little button on the mix fader and it pulls up the big one that looks like your aux end. You click the, the, um, uh, the link, which is a little chain so that if you pan left, both of them pan left or right. Then you click the two arrows, which is inverse. And what happens is, is that you can now, um, grab the left, uh, pan knob. And as you roll it towards center, the one on the right does the exact same move inverse. So what you're doing is you're narrowing the stereo field without using phase or a stereo plugin. Yeah. So what I like to do is if my record has hard panned guitars, a lot of high end content in them, a lot of like clicky flicky. What if it's an acoustic guitar, hard left and right, a lot of metal flicky clicky. What I'll do is grab the drum sub bus and I'll narrow it by 10 or 15. So it's like what it used to be 100 at 100. Now it's only 85, 85. Why? Because you've now created negative space outside the drum kit where your hard pan electric guitar lives. All right. So these small things like, yes, I want a big wide stereo image, but you can't have everything on top of each other. Right. Then. So these are small things. We talked about this. I like to fan my mixes like a peacock tail. So what I'll think about is how, what is the boundary of pan that I can have? And then if it's something like a stack of background vocals, I'll put a stereo expander on the bus as well. So I'm limiting how far it can go left or right. And then I'm enhancing the stereo, which effectively pushes the content away from the center and creates negative space in the center behind right. your lead vocals. Right. That's the thing that Serban Gahina does on like one of my favorite mixes to study is, um, uh, what is it? Five seconds from summer. Uh, young blood, young blood, and you want it. To, that song, right? All of the time. Uh, anyways, and so that record, I studied that record. I was like, why does this sound so good? And it's because he's peacock fanning the, the pan of the subgroups of the background vocals. And that's what I figured out. And I'm telling, it's like one of my like 2018, 2019, like mix learnings that like, cause you're always got to learn is that stereo inverse link limit the extension left and right that you get to create negative space on the outside. Then use stereo expanders to create ne negative space on the inside and you're limiting the column of audio you can have. So this audio now only exists from like, say, if it's a sack of background vocals, I've pushed it up against the butt, the, 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 the boundary. And so like the background vocal only, only exists from 70 to 60. It's not 70 through zero and zero to 70 on the other side. It's like I'm using a stereo expander to push it away from that. Yes, you're going to add a little bit of phase, but it's like a background vocal. Right, which makes it sound kind of wider anyway. Interesting, right? And so by doing this, think about that. that there was a quote. I went to a Manny American event with SSL in Hollywood years ago, and it stuck with me. And it's literally this. Manny American said, I wanted to become a better mixer, so I took a charcoal drawing class. What he meant was, Charcoal drawing is all about black on white paper. So what can you do? You can learn how to create negative space like they do in tattooing where they use skin breaks, right? And so things breathe when you create negative space. And that's yeah, the Negative key. space is good stuff. I remember learning that in, in art class and in architecture school as can, well. Uh, one last thing, and then I promise you can let me go. It's going to go long. <laughs> yeah. I said earlier in the mix, and we wanted to close with this. What is lyrical mixing? And lyrical mixing, the example is when I really figured it out for myself and it's become my ethos and it's a question. Like I don't get there yet until you, if you want a clinical, just make it better mix, you're not going to get lyrical mixing. You might because I can't help it. But if you want me to be artistic and you, you've got like, no, bro, I love what you do. Take it there. Okay, great. I need a little bit more time and budget and well, we'll take it there. So what is lyrical mixing? Lyrical mixing is understanding the emotional delivery content of the lyrics and what the artist is trying to say. I discovered this when I was working on that record with Brett Boyette, where it won the PMA Mark Award in 2018. And it stuck with me because it had emotional impact. And so what is it? Well, the song is about a guy who kills his wife. 
and he feels relief that he killed his wife. He's not feeling guilty about it. And in the song, it's talking about, I'm happy that the police are coming for me and I hear the sirens and my body is finally relaxing. Well, that's pretty effed Gruesome. up. It's pretty effed up. And it was this kind of bluesy, lap steel, like swampy thing. And I was listening to this and I was like, okay, what is he trying to convey? He's trying to convey this message that it was so bad that he's found relief in her death. And even though he's going to jail, at least it's better than where it was. That's a pretty dark and skewed perspective. So his perspective is on reality is distorted. He, this is not the way a normal human feels. So how do I emphasize his perspective being distorted? I could distort the vocal and I could automate the distortion. So when he says really effed up things, maybe I have a little phase or chorus on his lead vocal and I go in and out of the Just weird stuff. Out a little bit, yeah, yeah, like when he's talking normal, he didn't get any of it. But cool. as soon as it starts to go towards the bizarre and a weird perception and it's like abstract, I would start to crank up things like when you see um, a filmmaker, like a, a, like Fight Club, and as soon as Brad Pitt comes on the screen, is like, we are not the all-seeing monkeys Dude, of the world. we can't talk about Fight Club. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Um, but you remember how the how it vertical hold changes and it gets all screwy? Right. Because you're seeing inside his mind. And yeah, so the visual yeah. cue, so the auditory cue, this is beyond balance. This is beyond EQ. This is artistic lyrical mixing. And so what you want to do as a mixer is there's a level above competitive mixing. And that's what I call lyrical mixing, where you reach into the message of the song and you use your mixing tools to help emphasize emotional impact I hope Love that it, makes man. sense. That's fantastic, dude. Um, that's a great tip to close on too. And what amazing, like the last 30 minutes has just been like a flood of incredible oh, no. mixing advice. I can talk about this stuff all I die. Just love well, it. so thank you so much for joining us on the show again for round two. You're and, uh, and, and even like putting in extra time. I think pretty clearly we're probably going to have to like have you back again. Do or we'll, we, we'll do a one-year catch-up. We need to do like a, a mix clinic or something like that. So rock stars, drop oh, a comment in yeah. on this one and let us know if, if that's something that we should be putting together for you Absolutely. right Absolutely. We should do like a like a weekend thing where we like just have, yeah, yeah. We'll figure something out rock for stars. sure. That'd be, that'd be, hey, the thing is there's nothing better. Like it's cool when you hear about me talk about it and you guys are all going to be inspired and you're going to go try some stuff. But if I can sit you in my chair yeah, and totally. point at stuff, I'm going to blow your mind. You're going to yeah. be like, oh my God, it makes sense. Yeah. And then when you go home, you can just set it up. That's why Mix with the Masters was so great for me. This is why apprenticeships are so great because there's nothing like sitting in someone's chair and having them literally point at sounds. See that? When I do that, you hear that? There's a thing that people say, he taught me how to listen. And that's so hard to do without being in their chair. Anyways. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for being on the show, dude. You're welcome. Um, Rockstar's a reminder, we've got links to what we're talking about on the show notes. So you can click through and follow, follow up on this. Go to his website. Go listen to the YouTube stuff. And uh, make sure to go back and listen to episode 136 too. Yes. And hear some of the great vocal mixing yeah. tricks that he was sharing. And hit me up uh, at DR Ford Music or on Facebook. My uh, artist page is at DR Ford Producer. My website is drford.com. My, my name is Daniel Robert Ford. So it's, so Dr. Ford is my initials and my last name. So it's drford.com. If you want to shoot me an email, it's contact at drford.com. There's a Spotify list, a Spotify playlist and a bunch of YouTube stuff um, on my uh, thing as far as a studio tour and all that. And I'm here. I'm, I do my best to try and talk to everybody and I'm on Instagram a lot updating my stories. So um, talk to me and let's, let's jam. Awesome, dude. I'm Thanks ready. for joining us on the show, dude. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I look me. forward to uh, whatever we do next. Man. All right. I'm ready to rock. I'm ready to rock. <laughs> All right. On that note, cheers, man. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my 
my free course at MixMasterBundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lyd Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.